And we'll have on YouTube. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the April 26th public hearing and public meeting of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Uh, we'll begin by taking attendance. I'll turn it over to Mark Silverman to call roll the uh, call the roll. Chair Carroll. Here. Vice Chair Bland. Here. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Here. Commissioner Chapin. She's here. We know she's having trouble. There's I see her. It's Commissioner Chapin. Commissioner Chen. Commissioner Devonshire. Here. Commissioner Goldblum. Here. Commissioner Gustafson. Here. Commissioner Jefferson. Here. Commissioner Lefty. Commissioner, Commissioner, Commissioner Holford Smith. All right, and good morning and welcome to the April 26th public hearing and public meeting of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. This meeting is being held via Zoom and live streamed on our YouTube channel. You may, uh, if you wish to participate in the public hearing items, you may do so by joining the uh, Zoom webinar at the time, uh, estimated time for your item, which is shown on our agenda, which can be found on our website. And if you would just like to watch the proceedings, you may do so uh, by going to our YouTube channel. We'll begin the day with a public meeting item, which has already had a public hearing and is uh, returning today with a revised proposal in response to commissioner comments from the public hearing. And then we will move to our public hearing agenda. And with that, I will turn it over to Corey Harala, our director of preservation. Thank you, Sarah, and good morning, everybody. Uh, we'll start the Preservation Department public meeting agenda with the one and only item, item number one, LPC 21-09092, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1265, lot 7501, 30 Rockefeller Plaza, the RCA building and RCA building interior lobby, individual and interior landmark. This is an office building and designated lobby designed by the Associated Architects and featuring artwork by Jose Maria Cert and Frank Brangwin and constructed in 1931 to 33 as part of an art deco style office, commercial and entertainment complex. The application is to modify openings, extend walls and replace light fixtures within the interior lobby, install storefront infill at the ground floor and install attractions and accretions at the rooftop observation terraces. This was last presented at the public meeting of December 14th, 2021. No action was taken at that time. The staff will do a brief introduction before turning it over to the applicant team after we open the proceedings. Okay, thank you. And we'll, we'll go ahead and open the proceedings now so that that can be a seamless transition. So Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you make a motion to open the proceedings? So moved. And Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? No second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the applicants may uh, <coughs> speak right after the uh, staff introduces the project. And I'll note for the record that Thank Commissioner uh, uh, Goldblum is recused on this item. Okay, please go ahead. Good morning, Commissioners. Elizabeth Fagan, Preservation Staff. At the public meeting of December 14th, 2021, following the public hearing of September 14th, 2021, the Commissioners reviewed a revised proposal related to the top of the rock observation decks, which included modifications to ground floor storefronts and the designated interior lobby spaces, and new installations at the roof. The majority of the commissioners were largely supportive of changes to the storefronts, alterations to interior lobby walls and openings at the ground floor and mezzanine, the installation of an operable beam lift at the 69th floor roof deck, as well as the installation of a beacon at the 70th floor roof deck. The discussion at the December public meeting focused primarily on the design and visibility of the proposed 70th floor observation deck. Most commissioners continued to express concerns about its size and massing, as well as the materials selected. No action was taken at that time, and the commissioners requested that the applicants continue to work towards a design that further reduced visibility and better related to the architectural language of the building. And the applicants have returned with a revised proposal and will now walk you through those changes. Perfect. Thank you, Elizabeth, and good morning, commissioners. Kath Backelberg. Higgins, Quays, Barth, and Partners. I'm joined by E.B. Kelly and Anil Kachani of Tishman Spire. Um, I'll run through the presentation and we're all available to answer any questions that you may have. 
Um, as Elizabeth mentioned um, at the December public meeting um, where we presented a revised design for the viewing platform uh, at the 70th floor of 30 Rockefeller Plaza, uh, there were concerns expressed by the commissioners about the visibility of the platform, um, its massing, um, and its effect, its sort of horizontal effect on the reading of the building from the top, uh, excuse me, from, from the surrounding streets. And, and in response to that, the team has been working uh, in the intervening months to develop a different approach to uh, to the same goal. And that goal is obviously of enhancing the experience for the visitors to the observation deck and providing uninterrupted 360 degree views uh, of the surrounding uh, of the surrounding city. And um, this plan illustrates what what in plan is and, and in actuality a, a, a modest intervention now that actually um, I think satisfies all the concerns that the commissioners have expressed uh, in, in the initial public hearing in September and again in December. And, and what is being proposed, and I'll show you a rendering in just a moment, is a, a lift, um, this sort of almost impermanent vertical lift here on the west end of the 70th floor um, in place of the, the viewing platform that occupied approximately half of that floor. So let's let's get into it and I'll um, share with you uh, the visual. So just a quick look at this and then we'll back up and I'll give you the details. But on the left is an existing photograph looking west from the 69th floor. On the right is a rendering. And this is illustrating the replacement of the decommissioned Doppler radar, uh, the removal of all the antenna masks, and the installation of a, a vertical lift on the west end of the floor that rises uh, and lowers. This obviously is the lift in its, in its raised position. When it is lowered down to the deck, it, it is not visible at all. And its visibility from the surrounding streets obviously is very different than this sort of permanent horizontal platform. Um, it, as compared uh, to the views of the platforms from, from September and December that you all saw, where you did express concerns about the effect of this permanent structure would have on the reading uh, of the building, which does have this sort of vertical uh, component, also the horizontal setback and the terracing, but there was concern about uh, its visibility from the street and also its, its effect on the reading of the building. Um, continuing on and looking at uh, comparative plans, uh, an existing plan on the top, uh, the, the, the plan from the uh, December public meeting and the current revised plan on the bottom. So you can see the, the Doppler radar here, the decommissioned vents uh, at the center of the roof is that brick clad elevator bulkhead and the stairs that connect to the 69th floor. The viewing platform that was presented previously, uh, approximately 127 feet in length and about 30 feet in width. And then the revised design here, for this vertical lift. The lift itself is about 12 feet in diameter. Uh, there's a four foot setback off the edges of the parapet and there would be simple uh, low glass railings here just for protection for the people uh, on either side and for queuing. This is a, a 42 inch railing set basically at the same plane as the, uh, as the parapet. Um, in elevation compared to what, uh, what we presented in December, this is uh, the, the fixed uh, platform with the cast aluminum panels uh, and then the lift in its up position. The platform had a height of about 20 feet um, and at its top edge of the parapet and the viewing platform where one would stand will be, uh, or sorry, the viewing lift uh, will have a, a height of about 30 feet, but obviously will, will rise and lower uh, and, and completely disappear when it's not, uh, when not engaged, as you can see uh, in this elevation. The railing around the platform uh, where, where visitors would stand is no taller than the surrounding, uh, the surrounding parapet. Um, and then compared to the existing on the, uh, on the top and the proposed uh, in its raised position uh, directly below. So obviously there are features across the roof, non-historic features across the roof currently, uh, the Doppler radar, uh, the very tall antenna masts, uh, and uh, those elements would be removed, and the, the lift would be uh, installed on the west end of the uh, the west end of the roof. In section, uh, this is the previous version with a viewing platform uh, and the lift shown here. Again, you can see the lift is about 12 feet uh, in diameter at its base and uh, four feet offsets uh, off the perimeter with a, uh, a standing platform at 30 feet above uh, above the deck. Um, in its raised uh, section, in, in, in its raised position and lowered position, when it is lowered, uh, each of the five stages uh, stack their concentric circles. They stack together and they lower down into the volume of the 69th floor, so they disappear completely. And again, you can just see the glass railings here around the the platform itself, 
um, coplanar more or less with the surrounding parapets. Um, looking at some of the details uh, and talking a little bit about materiality, uh, the base will be a, a, an aluminum. It'll pick up the detailing of some of the cast aluminum spandrel panels that one sees around the perimeter of the 69th floor. It'll have a solid feel that will sort of root the whole uh, feature to, to, the, to the deck of the 70th floor. And then each of the concentric circles above the four stages will be in either a resin or a, a perforated uh, brass uh, with some backlighting. The lighting really will not be visible during the day, but we're just illustrating that there will be some uplighting as part of this at, at the top edge of each of these circles. And then details here showing uh, the metal platform. Uh, it'll be a, 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 a standing surface will be glass, as you can see here in the rendering, uh, supported by a metal frame, a glass railing at the top edge, and then these individual uh, sections with uplighting at the top edge of each, uh, of each ring. And then at the base, Again, the glass railing um, here around the platform uh, that will nest down into uh, into the deck and into the 69th floor when it's uh, when it's in the lowered position. Um, a few additional renderings. Again, an existing view on the left and proposed uh, with the with the, the the lift in its lowered position uh, and then it in its raised position. Um, uh, additional sections. So this is a, a longitudinal section of what was presented previously. Uh, again, the, the platform at about 130 feet in length. It also included a lift that, that would allow people to get from the 70th floor up into uh, or onto the, the viewing platform. And then just the, the simplified version here with just the lift itself um, in, its, in its raised position. The bulkhead uh, as it exists today would remain uh, and the antenna, the antenna masts around that lift would be removed. Um, comparative views to what you saw uh, in December and the current proposal with that central bulkhead and the lift to the west, and then uh, the existing uh, and the proposed with it in the down position and the up position. Um, and then a, a, another view, sort of a bird's eye view. And obviously the goal here is to provide uh, uninterrupted views uh, of the city beyond. And this provides both something that I think addresses your concerns, but also enhances the experience for the visitors and enhances the, the, the possibilities for, for these views to, uh, to the north, to the south, east, uh, and west. Um, a bit on the materiality, uh, a collection of uh, the palette, material palette here on the upper left. I will make the point here that this, this is uh, not going to be used. This is a photograph of, of an acrylic lens. We will not be using acrylic. The, the cladding around the upper stages, as I said, will either be resin or, or a perforated back, uh, a backlit metal. Uh, the base of the lift will be aluminum. There'll be bronze accents uh, and some of the, the railings will be, uh, will be stainless and obviously glass. And the intention here is to pick up on the materiality <clears throat> and tones that one sees both around the perimeter of the building, these cast aluminum panels, but also as you can see some of these other photographs uh, the entry to 30 Rockefeller Plaza with the cast glass, the sort of warm uh, yellow metal glow and, and glass that one sees on the exterior as well as within the lobby uh, of, uh, of 30 Rockefeller Plaza. Um, turning to the visibility uh, of this feature now from the surrounding streets, we have a series of renderings, the same viewpoints that you've seen before, but obviously significant uh, change to the visibility. So an existing view on the left uh, and a revised view with uh, the lift in the up position, um, as well as the details. Again, you can see in the existing view, the, the various antenna masts and the Doppler, uh, and then the proposed view with the beacon on the east end and the lift in the up position uh, on the west end. Compared now with uh, what you saw in December, detailed views of that viewing platform on the top of the building, uh, and now replaced with, uh, with a lift in the up position. Um, as well, we've been talking about this, and as this project has evolved, this 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 other project in the in the in the foreground on 46th Street and Fifth Avenue continues to move forward. So now this is illustrating uh, the the massing that's that's available uh, to us online of the Xtel development on the uh, northwest corner of 46th Street and Fifth Avenue. So um, once this project is underway, this view uh, from the south uh, on Fifth Avenue will be completely obscured. Um, turning now to the uh, 6th Avenue side, this is also from uh, 46th Street. Again, existing on the left, proposed, uh, revised on the right with a lift in the up position and a detailed view of that. You can just make out the top portion of the lift here uh, in this detail rendering. Um, compared with what you saw back um, in, uh, in December with the platform and, and the lift, 
uh, and then existing and proposed with a lift in the down position where it basically completely disappears from view. Uh, there, are, there are a few slots on 53rd Street. There's this one moment where you were sort of in the, uh, across the street from the plaza uh, with the CVS headquarters building here and the building is referred to as Pink Rock directly uh, to the east. There's this moment where uh, the beacon and the lift uh, would be visible uh, in the same view. Uh, and you can see detail here with, with the, the antenna mast and then those two features that are part of this application here in the detailed view. Um, and then turning um, from the west, again, this sort of moment, uh, a few, maybe 50, 75 feet on the west side of Broadway, uh, just between these tall buildings on 6th Avenue, uh, there is this moment where uh, the back of 30 Rockefeller Plaza is visible. Uh, and then you can see the existing view here uh, with the bulkhead and the antenna mast and Doppler and the proposed detailed view with a lift in its raised position, obviously, uh, when the lift is in the lowered position. Uh, it will not be visible. Um, and the lift will be uh, in use, you know, through the day, depending on, um, depending on, on, on demand. Uh, it is uh, up for about uh, five minutes and then it's lowered down anywhere from, you know, two minutes when it is busiest to uh, considerably longer when, um, when it's not in use, obviously. Um, and what I'd like to do also just quickly to run through the other components of the application. These are uh, features that you had seen in September and December. Uh, back in December, there was a consensus among the commissioners that, that everyone was comfortable with these other elements, but because they are part of the application, I do want to just run through these quickly. Uh, there are modifications on the ground floor to storefronts uh, and, uh, and the interior lobby. Um, that are really keyed to circulation, wayfinding, uh, egress um, on the exterior. Uh, that this includes changes to to these three storefronts, with new infill swing doors and revolving doors, similar to infill in other locations around the building. Uh, detailing to match uh, detailing of of the other storefronts, obviously and materiality as well uh, within the lobby. The extension of this wall, and you can see an existing photo here and a rendered view here, bringing this wall forward finishing it in the same uh, Champlain black marble um, and the, the bronze trim uh, and introducing a, an inner layer between the new walking surface and the existing terrazzo to protect uh, the historic terrazzo as, as part of this new construction. Up on the mezzanine level, modifications to uh, one bay here. Um, you can see on the left an existing photo and a rendered view. Again, this is to help um, circulation from, uh, from the upper floors as visitors are coming downstairs and out. Uh, this, this work is not visible from the main floor of the lobby at the ground level, uh, and is really just a, a modification that's visible to those who are passing through this portion of the mezzanine. Uh, on the 69th floor, uh, the introduction of the, the, the beam experience, which will afford views, um, uninterrupted views out uh, to the north across, uh, across Central Park in the city. Um, and then up on the 70th floor, uh, as I mentioned, the, the proposed vertical lift here on the west end, um, the change to the concrete uh, pavers uh, and the introduction of a mosaic a tile decking across the, the roof and the rooftop beacon. And then two views here, the existing uh, view looking east with these concrete pavers replaced uh, by this sort of mythologically celestial inspired mosaic and then the rooftop beacon uh, on the far east end of the roof. Uh, with that, I'll stop and we're happy to take any questions you all may have. Great, thank you. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Yes, Commissioner Devonshire, please go ahead. Is the, uh, is the height shown necessary to get 360 degree views or could it be shorter? Uh, it is, can we go back to the, go back to the section? I, I, can I control, can I go back? Sorry, this is gonna take a little while. Um, it, it's, it, I'm gonna answer the, the question is, without showing it. The, 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 the height gets you above the elevator bulkhead uh, and provides, provides interrupt, uninterrupted views. So it, it allows you to be above that central elevator bulkhead. Thank you. Yes. All right, other questions? All right, I'm not seeing any other questions. So I'm starting to um, unmute all of you so that we can move to our discussion. And I do want to thank the applicants for working so hard on this. And I think that, you know, 
as a commission, this is one of our most important landmarks, and we recognize that this is a really important landmark to the city um, that that uh, really kind of contributes to the vibrancy of the city, and I think uh, attracts residences and uh, businesses that are around it, but also attracts visitors. And I think that um, allowing for new circulation and and, and uh, these activities on the roof, um, you know, I think will support tourism, will support even the help support the recovery of the city. So I think, um, you know, this is an important landmark, but, you know, we also have been recognized that as an important landmark, we were trying to balance those great goals that this building can contribute to and preserving the kind of architectural form and character of the building. And I know that you have worked very hard, uh, our concerns, you know, I think we were very supportive of the storefront changes, the changes to the interior lobby and mezzanine, the beacon and even the beam ride. Um, but it our discussion really focused on this platform and how you saw it from these views, both in terms of the amount of visibility and its relationship to the architecture itself. And so, uh, you know, we, you had a second design that I think we still felt was interesting, but still didn't quite address those concerns. And now you've come back with a much reduced design where you've eliminated the platform altogether and just redesigned the lift to be operable, the operable ride. And, um, which significantly reduces the visibility and makes it more comparable to the Doppler and the mass and other things that have traditionally been up there. And also um, when it's, and it eliminates the visibility when it's not in use. So I think you've, you know, you've really listened and come a long way. So I do appreciate that. I appreciate all of the thought and working to uh, working uh, so closely with us as we, uh, think about the right balance here. So I just wanted to kick off with that and, and acknowledge how responsive you've been. So thank you. And um, we'll begin our discussion. Commissioner Lutfi, would you start this one? Uh, sorry, hold on one second. And I do, I think, you know, while you're getting ready, I'll just say that I think um, you know, these views are really incidental views, this and the view from the West, where I think you don't really know which building it is that you're looking at. Um, again, much reduced in these views and invisible in other ways. Um, but I think our concern was primarily about the Fifth Avenue views, one of which is about to be obscured by a new development but, um, from the North looking South. Go ahead. Yeah, so I... I have to say, I think you summed it up pretty succinctly, Sarah. I, mean, I do also wanna thank the applicant for, and it's not only on this presentation, I feel this way with, with pretty much every application we receive that when we provide input, um, the applicant is willing to go back, you know, set, not once, but several times to try to address uh, the issues that we bring up. And I think, and that this, this <clears throat> modification is actually a good one because it, uh, you know, even though on some level conceptually, I would prefer that it not exist, but given um, the goals of the project, uh, and I certainly am in support of um, making sure that our uh, not only our architectural treasures, but the places that are considered to be treasures by the people who live here and also visit this city. And, and Rockefeller Center is certainly one of them, as are the iconic viewscapes of the city that, uh, that uh, <clears throat> residents and tourists get to see when they visit the tops of, of of all of these majestic buildings. I, I appreciate the importance of um, continuing to think of ways to uh, enhance those experiences. So I do believe that in this instance, um, as you mentioned, uh, I, I, I actually like this redesign. I think it's very clever, it's well done. It's 
good looking. And as you said, when it's not projected, it's not visible. And um, when it is, it's much more modestly visible uh, than before you know, so to speak. <laughs> I don't want to exaggerate that. And so I, I, I can accept this. And again, I thank the applicant. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Jefferson. Um, my, yeah, I think they solved all the issues I had about the podium. And, and I, I, I think it works. And I, I'm especially happy with the paving, uh, the, the mosaic paving, I think it's very happy. And uh, I can accept all eight items that was proposed. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Gustafson. I, it's, a, it's a striking um, response to, <laughs> to um, uh, what the applicant heard from us. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, often uh, applicants hear our words and they miss our tone and our direction. Um, and, I, and I think they got it um, pretty clearly. Um, and it adds a new um, uh, aspect to our analysis, which is to say, you know, when we look at visibility, um, you know, we look at, you know, the bulk that's being, that's visible. Um, we look at the quantity of visibility points there are, the angles at which it's visible. Um, we look at the background, but here is something new, a time element, um, which is to say, how often um, is it visible? Um, and uh, um, and, and it's, it's kind of interesting. We may never see something quite like this again. Um, and, it, and I think it is the first, for, certainly for me in these years. Um, and, I, and I think that all of that put together means that um, uh, it's really going to go largely unnoticed um, by um, by the public in in the, in the context of this building. So um, so I think that's fantastic. And I already was okay with uh, the lobby uh, changes, et cetera. So um, I, I'm on board. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes, I, 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 I'm not sure if I was, um, if, if there were others, but I, I certainly remember expressing um, enthusiasm about the Gavellini design for the for what was previously proposed and I thought it was an interesting um, riff interpretation on the existing ornamentation and I, I actually thought that the that it that the roof of this building could take this um, element even though visible um, but and so I'm so that was my position then I, I think there must have been lots of um, inputs, even potentially beyond our own uh, concerns and, and critiques that must have led to the reduced scope here. And I think that that's perfectly reasonable. What, what I do think is, is nice now is that um, the kind of the original spirit of the observation roof, the Rockefeller Center observation roof is, is I think, um, further elaborated, developed, and, 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 and they're, they're sticking to this kind of idea of observation in all of those early images that um, actually are in the appendix now, but we, that we've, been, we've seen before of sort of a kind of um, people reclining, you know, sitting on the roof uh, and, and peering over the edges. This issue of observation now with the kind of the, the, the lifts on the, on the bars and, and this new lift I think are are you know new ways of trying to to achieve that kind of versions of observation. I think it's it's sweet and it's I don't know how necessary it actually is because people can still peer over the edges and observe. But I don't think that it um, that it undermines or diminishes the experience of the current roof. I'm happy for the fact that the visibility is so considerably limited. And, and only at intervals, um, there'll probably be a lot of people standing in line waiting to get up into this rather reduced um, space up there when for the lift. But again, I think it's in the spirit of observation and does not, um, and, 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 is, and observation out of, from the roof, but not observation that is visibility from the street. And I think that that's a positive thing. And so I can support it. And I uh, feel the same way about all of the, um, 
proposals that we've discussed before for the interior and the lobbies. Thank you. Commissioner Chapin? Uh, I uh, agree with the comments of uh, my fellow commissioners and of uh, the chair about the project. I think that, uh, you know, it is not going to be uh, visible in a distracting way. And it serves a, a, a purpose uh, for tourism in New York. Uh, and I think that the uh, bottom, uh, the uh, lobby changes and other changes that we looked at last time are also appropriate. So I can approve this as presented. Thank you. Commissioner Devonshire. I think the lobby changes are appropriate. Um, I think this is infinitely preferable to the previous designs. Thank you. Commissioner Bland. Um, you know, there are rooftop additions and then there are rooftop additions. Um, as I think my colleagues know, I'm often uh, more um, accepting of visible rooftop additions uh, than some others. Uh, but I think on this case, this iconic, and as um, Sarah said, one of our most important landmarks, uh, the top of the building here was crucial. And uh, seeing what we saw before was one one or two or three degrees too far for me too. So I think what's being proposed here now is exciting. Uh, it's, it's there when it's there and it's not there when it's not there, uh, which introduces a level of kinetic quality to architecture, which I've always been interested in. Mostly uh, we don't want kinetic quality in architecture means uh, something is about to fail. But um, nonetheless, I think this is exciting and uh, so much preferable to what we saw before. And uh, I think it's wholly appropriate. And I congratulate the team for sticking with it and, um, and you know, exploring so many, I'm sure, uh, options that we didn't even see uh, to come up with what I think will be a very exciting uh, and appropriate addition to the top of this icon. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, so I think we have a consensus to approve. Commissioner Latfi, would you make the motion? Sure. Uh, in the matter of LPC 21-09092, 30 Rockefeller Plaza, RCA building and RCA building interior lobby, individual and interior landmark. An office building designed and designated lobby designed by the Associate Architects and Featuring Artwork by Jose Maria Sert and Frank Brangwin and constructed in 1931-33 as a part of an Art Deco style office, commercial and entertainment complex. The application is to modify openings, extend walls and replace light fixtures within the interior lobby, install storefronts infill at the ground floor and install attractions and accretions at the rooftop observation terraces. I recommend approval finding that the proposed ground floor storefront infill is in keeping with the configuration of other commission approved storefront infill at this building and will match the materials and details of the historic storefront infill throughout the center and the work will require only limited removal of plain granite bulkhead cladding. That the north and south sides of the ground floor corridors are not perfectly symmetrical and have been altered in the past, therefore the work will not disrupt a pristine plan. That visibility across the lobby is limited due to central elevated banks and stairways. Therefore, the further change in symmetry of the plan will be largely imperceptible within the space and the proposed work will only be apparent when walking through the North Corridor, that the work will entail lowering only one vitrine opening, the existing wall and floor finishes will be retained and protected, and that historical medical metal finishes the door and some stone will be retained and relocated, thereby limiting the loss of historic material. That the proposed enlarged opening at the mezzanine will not detract from the overall experience of the space and will only result in the removal of minimal historic fabric. That the rooftop terraces of the building historically have been used as observation decks and featured 
various installations and accretions. Therefore, the proposed work is in keeping with the historic use of the building top floors that the existing obsolete equipment, including the Doppler radar will be removed and that the proposed new installations will be less visible from the street than these prior installations. That the proposed rotating beam lift experience and telescoping observation deck will recess into the 69th and 70th floor roof terraces and will not be visible while inactive and will only be visible from long distances while active and therefore will not detract from the significant views of this building from public thoroughfares. That the top of the building historically has featured illuminated signage and the proposed beacon is in keeping with this effort to call attention to the top of we'll call recall historic beacons found at other notable skyscrapers. That the dynamic quality of beam lift, observation deck and beacon will not be perceptible from from most public thoroughfares due to the height of these installations above the ground. That des the design of the beacon lantern echoes the historic Atlas statue found at the ground level of 45 Rockefeller Plaza, as well as a historic fixture at the roof as evidenced in historic photos and therefore will be compatible with the Art Deco style and artistic features of the center. That the design and finishes of, of proposed of the proposed observation deck relate to decorative motifs found throughout the center and will complement the building while standing out as a contemporary structure and that the proposed work will not diminish the special architectural or historic character of this beloved landmark. Thank you and Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? Oh, second. Thank you and Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. With eight in favor, none opposed, the motion passes. All right, that's approved. Thank you and good luck. And we'll Thank now move to our public hearing agenda. Okay, we'll start the public hearing agenda with uh, item number one, LPC 22-05546, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the Borough of Brooklyn, block 243, lot 33, 100 Pierpont Street in the Brooklyn Heights Historic District. This is an Anglo-Italianate style row house built in 1857, and the application is to modify the front facade and area way. Hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. They now have control of the presentation. Um, just click on your screen. You can advance the slides using your arrow keys or your mouse. Uh, please state your name for the record and you may begin. Uh, hello, commissioners. Brendan Coburn speaking for 100 Pierpont Street. Um, can we go back to the first slide for a second? Great, thank you. Um, this is uh, this, the, the two primary things we are trying to accomplish in this project is to create a more um, um, pronounced entryway for through the garden level of this house and then clean up the area way and make it uh, more functional for the owners. I would just have you take a quick peek at the tax photo here on the front. Um, this is one of three Anglo-Italianate houses. Um, it, this photograph shows it when it still had a stoop. All of them once had stoops. Um, all of them have lost their stoop. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh oh, oh, there we go. Um, this is the current condition at the house. Our, our uh, project is there in the middle. It is the one with the pumpkins on top of the enframement. Um, and, uh, and you can see that it has uh, a sort of, uh, I think a little bit too modest uh, in enframement around the door. If we could go to the next slide, please. These photos I'm providing for a little bit of context to explain the project. So again, we see our house is uh, head on there. The brownstone house, the one to the left, uh, has a, a, a taller enframement that you see. And the one to the right also has a taller enframement and another sort of funny um, opening into a service uh, 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 door. Um, we are also, as part of this proposal, uh, planning to drop the um, 
area way that is in front of the window. So if, if you look at photograph number three, you'll see that the area way is currently raised up at the level of the windowsill at the garden level. So part of this project is sort of cleaning up that area way as well. Next slide, please. This is just, again, the context. So you can see the three houses as they currently exist. Uh, ours is in the middle. The, the uh, white one on the left has the taller and framement and the, uh, the you, you window, sorry, the building at uh, 98 also has a taller and framement. And you can see that all these houses have sort of altered um, their uh, parlor and garden, garden floors from what they were originally. They um, are close to what they were originally up above, um, not so much the 102. Next slide, please. Um, just a little more detail so you can see clearly what, how the three houses have been manipulated over the years. Next slide, please. Okay, this is this drawing is meant to show the existing enframement as it relates to the facade um, when viewed from street level. So it's it's uh, you know everything is sort of clipped off because the stairs are going down. So existing is on the left and proposed is on the right. Um, and I will ask for the next slide, please. Um, this shows all of this more clearly because we are now cutting away the section to reveal the sort of full. Um, uh, uh, design of the of that garden floor entry. And uh, I also want to just draw your attention to two other aspects of this uh, project, which is the um, the uh, removal of the uh, raised area way below the window uh, at the garden floor where we're flattening all of that out. And then we're also um, slightly elevating the uh, wall that exists on our property that separates our property from from the neighbor's property to the right or to the west and putting a planter up there to um, provide a little more uh, privacy uh, and screening of the neighbor's uh, uh, service area and trash enclosure. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this slide is, uh, is included for two reasons. One, to show this sort of typical approach to um, uh, that you see in these row house neighborhoods where the stoop has been removed and the, uh, the, the main door to the house has been dropped down to the garden or basement level of the house. And it is uh, the, the sort of frequent strategy for these things is to um, allow that, that window, that enframement um, to pop up and engage the window on the parlor floor in, 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 a, in a number of different ways, sometimes actually causing that parlor floor window to get smaller, sometimes just engaging the sill of that floor. Um, so there's, there is a range of, uh, of ways of handling this. The other thing I wanted to call your attention to in terms of precedent is that all of these um, uh, doorways uh, employ some sort of transom to make, to create a greater uh, level of importance for that door to make the door appear larger. And uh, in, in the case of drawing um, number three, the transom is just a solid wood panel. In the case of, uh, sorry, photograph number one, it is uh, decorative iron on a painted black steel background. In the case of photograph number two, it's a real transom with a, a transparent glass uh, uh, um, transom. And then in number four, it is a translucent glass transom. Um, and all of these, these transoms are, uh, are, we believe, sort of concealing a structural spandrel that, that exists behind them. So if we could now go to the next slide. Um, these, uh, these, are, I'm, I, these are included as um, examples of the uh, line of the area way uh, on uh, Pierpont Street and how uh, there's typically a nice brownstone curb detail with, uh, with uh, decorative iron out in front. Uh, next, next slide. These are other examples of um, how the area ways on this block have been handled uh, in terms of a, some sort of brownstone planter, decorative ironwork, um, just, just precedent and context for this project. And then next slide, please. This is, we include this because uh, when you, uh, when we look at the a more detailed drawing that's coming up shortly, um, we are adding a layer of rustication 
or sort of at, uh, rusticating the garden level of this house slightly differently from the parlor level um, in an attempt to um, you know, create a very clear hierarchy between the lower floor and then the parlor floor. So these are just examples of some of the rustication you see in the neighborhood, um, the sort of dressing of the edges, the chisel toothed um, uh, brownstone on the on garden level. Uh, next, please. Um, now this is a blow up of the existing condition. And you'll see that the enframement on our house is quite low. It's below these two panels on the parlor floor. And you can compare that to the two houses on either side with the taller enframements. So next slide, please. And this is our proposed design. And so we have, what we have done is we've brought our enframement up to the underside of the sill of the parlor floor and, um, and then sort of extended the, uh, the um, fascia of that enframement across to create a slight projection uh, at uh, separating the lower floor and the upper floor. And then we have uh, the brownstone for the, for the garden level and the window is articulated with a, a sort of a, a chiseled edge and then a um, chisel tooth finished, sorry, it's tooth chisel stucco finish, which we achieved um, using a um, meat tenderizer in the, in, the, in the brownstone. And this is something that we see quite a bit around Brooklyn Heights. If we go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is a further uh, bill, uh, blow up of that enframement, and you can see that we're, the stucco will all be the same color. The stucco at the uh, garden level has this chisel tooth finish. Um, would also draw your attention to the, uh, the iron door is the existing iron door, which we are reusing. And we are proposing to add this transom above. And our proposed handling of the transom is to use a uh, sort of distressed antique mirror transom panel with the gilded lettering of the address on top of it um, and then surrounded with ironwork. And that is, that is what is being proposed. If during the course of construction, we discover that a real transom is possible, that there is not a structural member behind this part of the facade, then we would uh, switch this transom to a transparent glass transom that allowed light and uh, a, a taller sense in there. Um, the, the section drawing on the le left is showing the slightly elevated um, brownstone wall and then a uh, black steel um, impermanent planter atop that wall, uh, all meant to sort of provide a little bit of additional screening for the neighbor. Next slide, please. Um, and this is the plan showing our modifications to the area way. And uh, the, the, uh, we're doing two things primarily. One is we're lowering that front area way and it will all be done in bluestone. And then that by lowering it, it gives us the ability to hide all of our trash out of view um, from the house, from the neighbors uh, and, and neatens up that area. We're also pulling the stair back a little bit closer to the street we are extending the brownstone curb um, that currently is at the uh, street facing front of the planter across and returning it towards the planter. And then we are um, extending the ironwork so that uh, then our client can uh, shut the ironwork in the evening and, and have a, a, a defined space. Um, and then we're replacing the, so the uh, stair landing in the front area way and the steps will now all be done in, in um, solid bluestone. Next slide, please. This rendering just shows our proposed completed project and, and um, in particular how that uh, curb line extends across the front uh, of the, at the top of the stairs going down and just the massing of the, um, of our uh, enlarged enframement. So next slide, please. Uh, and, this is our final slide. I just uh, have it here so that you can um, look at the two, the existing and the proposed side by side. That's it, finished. Great, thank you very much. Commissioners, do we have questions? Yes, Commissioner Bland, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, good presentation, very inclusive. 
one question, or, and I should know the answer uh, since I live down the block. Um, are there other gates that separate the, uh, the little front yards from um, the street sidewalk? That's a good question. And I don't know if I know the answer. Um, you mean specifically at the staircase? Yes. Yeah. Uh, All right. Well, that's an answer in itself. Yeah, I, I don't know either. <laughs> I should. Yeah, we've done it before, not on this block. Um, actually, okay. at 118 Pierpont and 108 Pierpont, in the if you look at our uh, LPC sheet 109, those both of those areaways are sort of fully gated in. Okay, thank you. All right, Commissioner Devonshire. Uh, I'm I'm curious about the size of the, the the replication size of the stone at the ground level. Um, what your decision making was behind that? Because now you've got three different sizes of stone, and actually brownstone, um, I don't believe ever would have come in a in a size that large traditionally. What what was your decision making on that? Yeah, it was. Uh... It's kind of simple, which was I uh, I drew it with smaller, and I couldn't get the uh, couldn't get the proportions I liked with the sort of uh, you know um, lintel piece at the top. Then I divided it into um, into uh, in half, you know, to to subdivide the the horizontal the the uh, lock rail of the window, and then that actually worked out for the. Um, for the floor above, and then the the lowermost is just the leftover um, uh, a dimension of that of that of that that piece. Um, so it was really just uh, experimenting with a couple of different uh, horizontal lines to see which one uh, sort of worked out worked out the best. And this is where we arrived. Got it. Thanks. Okay. Other questions. All right, let's see if we have public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to testify in this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Sasha Seeley, who will take us through the testimony beginning with anyone who signed up in advance. Alrighty, thank you. Judy Stanton from Brooklyn Heights Association, you'll be receiving a request from me. Let me just... All right, Judy, I see you have accepted my request. Please just unmute your mic and state your name for the record. Then you can begin your testimony. Judy Stanton for the Brooklyn Heights Association. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Good, okay. Brendan has already directly addressed the BHA concern, um, but I'll read it anyway. Uh, we generally support this application. Our only concern is the new transom window. Our understanding is that the proposed antique mirror behind is designed to simulate normal transom glass, which cannot be installed because it would face into the building structure above the basement ceiling. If that is the case, we believe that a painted wood panel behind the transom would be more typical rather than a mirror. If it turns out that there is no structure in that area, then regular glass could be used. We are not in favor of simulating a glass transom. Thank you. Uh, thank you, that's it. Alrighty, thank you. Let me just take a glance back over the attendees. See if there's anyone else who wishes to speak on this item. And I do not see any more hands raised. So I will just note for the record that Brooklyn Community Board 2 recommends approval of this application and I will pass it back over to you, Chair Carol. Okay, thank you very much. So would you like to speak more about the transom panel or address any other final comments you have you know i um it's not it's not hugely important to me i think it's a it's a visual trick using an antique mirror will sort of create the illusion of there being uh, uh glass there and i think will allow the address to pop pop more it's but if if everybody is going to be more comfortable with uh you know a black painted piece of steel behind that uh, transom with the address on that. I think we are totally fine with that as is the client. 
Okay, thank you. And I think in your examples, you showed that there were a combination of wood and glass panels all probably concealing a structural beam. Yeah, I think so. I think that's where we're gonna get stuck, so. Okay, all right, commissioners, any final questions? All right, I think what I'll do is um, start to send you a request to unmute so that we can close the hearing and begin our discussion, whoops. Oh, one of you, I just hit mute because <laughs> you were faster than I was. Um, all right, Commissioner Chapin, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Gustafson, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. Um, and again, this is a proposal to address the ground floor and area way. Um, and thank you. I want to thank Brendan for a very clear presentation. And we'll begin our discussion. Commissioner Bland, our resident commissioner, would you like to start this one? Not just generally resident, but in the next block. <laughs> and as of September, it will be 50 years. <laughs> wow. Block. So amazing. Um, and, um, and like many days i walked to uh, the subway this morning or right by this house and checked it out these are very modest changes uh but important uh to um clean up as brendan says that um <clears throat> which is not a very messed up even now uh front yard but i think these uh changes make uh make improvements and, uh, and they're appropriate um i i think i support uh, judy stanton's point of view about uh, a, a mirrored um, transom if, if, if a real transom is not possible and would support just a black uh, painted steel as Brendan has uh, indicated would be acceptable to him and the client. Um, I would also, um, uh, given Michael Devonshire's uh, comment about the size of, of actual uh, brownstone pieces, uh, ask him to look perhaps one more time with, with the staff uh, uh, at, at the uh, vertical <clears throat> of the stone or, or the scoring of the stucco to look like stone. It seems to me to all start with the window and I think certainly the head and the, and the sill of the window should be uh, coterminous with uh, score lines. So the question is, is it two or three? And then how does it work out uh, above and below that. It's a simple little geometry game that I think uh, Brendan Coburn has already done, but maybe just look at it one more time. Otherwise, I think this is wholly uh, 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 appropriate. I support it, including the gate. Great, thanks. And I think there are uh, many area ways that are enclosed, not necessarily stoops, but area ways, certainly. Okay, um, Commissioner Devonshire. Yeah, I'm generally in favor of everything that's going on here. I agree with with Fred. I'm, I, you know, it could be just that uh, there are a few stone nerds that um, are familiar with how this stuff came out of the ground and and got cut. But um, that that lower coursing seems awkward and large to me. And I I'm wondering if they can't work with staff to uh, to work out a, a better proportional system. Okay, great. Thank you. Commissioner Goldblum? No disagreement. I think it's appropriate. I think Fred, I agree with Fred's comments wholeheartedly. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Chapin? Uh, I also agree with Commissioner Bland's comments. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I think in, in general, this is totally appropriate. And I want to say that uh, we passed, uh, we hit 50 years. Uh, in our location on uh, in 2020, so we're a little ahead of Fred, <laughs> but but not in Brooklyn Heights. So we have a lot of ties to it. Anyway. Okay, Commissioner Shamir Barron. Uh, I think that what's being proposed here for the facade and for the area way is is very appropriate, acceptable. Uh, I understand Commissioner Defenshire's uh, questions and concerns, and I think that the applicant should work with the staff just to um, be clear about those, about the, the brownstone there. But otherwise, I think this is a very acceptable proposal. 
Okay, thank you. Do you have a position on the transom panel? Uh, I actually am pretty agnostic about it. I think that the reflective, you know, what they're proposing is this kind of um, reflective surface is perfectly fine, but if, if others think it should be metal or painted, I'm fine with that too. Okay. And I think um, Commissioner Chapin and Goldblum, you were agreeing with Commissioner Bland on the idea of a metal transom. Just to make sure I have. I'm, that. I'm, I'm. I guess I'm with, I'm with Adi on that. I, I, I thought the mirror was an interesting approach, but if others feel that it's uh, not good, I'll, I'll go along. I, I think I could go with either one, but uh, as Commissioner Bland is so familiar with the uh, location and it is a little atypical, I feel that I'm kind of uh, leaning to his view at this point. Okay, Commissioner Gustafson. Yeah, I, I think it's appropriate as is. All right, and did you have a position on the trans? You can go either way, it's fine. Okay. Hey, Commissioner Jefferson. Um, I was I was taken by the sensitivity of the architect on this project. I mean, the the proportional shift that changed the whole thing was quite masterful. Um, uh, so I can approve this. And the panel, um, I'll use a word called, <laughs> that I kind of like agnostic about it. It, it, whichever way the majority goes. Okay, and Commissioner Lutfi. Um, I also want to say that I think this project is all about refinements and um, the architect has done an excellent job. Um, and I agree with all the comments about working with staff on the stonework and and fine with the transom as it is. Okay, so I think We probably have six for the transom as is, but I think that we'll still suggest that they look at it with staff, you know, whether it's mirrored, spandrel, or painted, and just explore it a little bit further. Um, and we will have them work with the staff on the, the scoring pattern. So let me go ahead and compose this. Um, in the matter of docket number 22-05546, 100 Pierpont Street in the Brooklyn Heights Historic District, an Anglo-Italianate style row house built in 1857. This is an application to modify the front facade and area way. Um, I note that the building's style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Brooklyn Heights Historic District. The commission, uh, I also note that the historic parlor floor entrance and stoop were removed and a sunken areaway and basement level entrance created prior to the designation of the historic district. Um, I recommend approval with modifications, finding that the early 20th century alterations to the facade's lower levels and area way were not unique or finely crafted. Therefore, the proposed alterations will not eliminate a significant later alteration. That the organization of the proposed facade elements and replication of select historic features will be consistent with early 20th century alterations commonly found at row houses of this style and age in conjunction with the removal of a stoop and will form a unified composite Position, utilizing features which relate well to the remaining historic features. That the proposed brownstone stucco will closely replicate the existing facade materials and finishes, further supporting the unity of the facade. That the refinement of the entrance surround details and raising of the lintel level will help support the primacy of the entrance in keeping with the historic character of the house. That if field conditions prohibit the installation of a, a setback Right, let me leave that one off for uh, the moment. Um, that um, the proposed areaway changes are in keeping with typical air, uh, areaways throughout the streetscape. However, I recommend that the, ver uh, the applicant work in consultation with the staff to study the vertical dimensions of the ashlers proposed at the ground floor rustic rustication to better relate to the proportions and scale of the facade. And, um, and that the applicant continue to explore the, uh, the transom panel, whether it be a mirror or spandrel or uh, painted steel um, uh, and to be inconsistent with the streetscape. 
of that. Um, Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? I so second. All right, Mark, will you, uh, will you uh, call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. With nine in favor, none opposed, the motion passes. All right, so please continue to work with the staff and we'll move to the next item. Sarah, okay, thank you. Sarah, yes. can I say something before you move? Yes. I just did a little calculations and I think I have probably walked by this, this block, this house over my 50 years there, six, at least 16,000 times. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> that is amazing. Just rough calculations, how much we actually see our neighborhood over a long period of time. And all that time, I still couldn't tell if there were, I couldn't remember if there were other gates that separate. <laughs> but nonetheless, it's a beautiful block and a beautiful street. And I feel so lucky to have lived there for so long. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that, Fred. <laughs> All right. Uh, on that note, we'll go ahead and move to item number two, LPC 22-04976, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn block 1964, lot 19, 113 St. James Place in the Clinton Hill Historic District. This is an Italianate style row house designed by Peter Donlin and built in 1865. And the application is to construct a rear yard addition. Okay, hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Adrian, you now have control of the presentation. You just need to click on your screen. Okay. And then you can advance the slides using your arrow keys um, or your mouse. Please state your name for the record and you may begin. Sure, thank you. Uh, hi, good morning. I'm Adrian Coleman and I'm here with my colleagues, Jess Hinshaw, Andrea Fisk and Matthew Monteroso. We're from Shapeless Studio and architecture and interior design firm. Today, we're presenting our proposed addition to a townhouse at 113 St. James Place. As you know, St. James Place is within the historic district of Clinton Hill. These are photographs of the townhouse's front facade in the 1960s and the present day. Although we are doing some minimal cosmetic work on the street side, this is being reviewed at staff level. Our presentation this morning will simply cover the more substantial work at the rear yard where we are adding a two-story extension. This photograph shows the rear facade of 113 St. James Place as it currently stands. Neither the chimney or the small shed you see here are original and we will be removing them. In these photographs, you can see the neighbors on both sides already have additions. Both of these were LPC approved. At 115 St. James Place on the left, the addition is two stories, partial width and quite deep. At 111 St. James Place on the right, the addition is one story, full width and shallower. As you will see in the coming slides, our objective was to negotiate between these two existing conditions while also adhering to various code requirements. This drawing shows the rear facades of 115, 113 and 111 St. James Place at present. In this elevation, we are indicating our proposed extension. It is two stories tall, made of dark brick with black metal railings. We will show you in the upcoming images that the left portion is of a comparable depth to the addition at 115 on the left, and the right portion is of a comparable depth to the addition at 111 on the right. This drawing is a cross section of the existing townhouse. And here you see the cross section of our proposal. As we mentioned earlier, one side of the extension is shallower while the other extends further. This negotiation between the existing additions at 111 and 115 St. James Place is illustrated in this diagram where you can see more clearly the L shape of our proposed addition. Some aspects of the shape are prescribed to us by various building codes. In this isometric drawing from our DOB filing, we indicate some of these code requirements. For instance, the deck is set back 30 feet from the rear lot 
as this is as far back as we are allowed to build. The court at level one is designed to meet the minimum requirements of 200 square feet with no dimensions smaller than 10 feet. This diagram indicates all of the existing row house extensions on our project's block. There are 72 existing row houses and 32 of the, 36 of them, I'm sorry, or 50% already have additions. Of these 36, 21 of the additions have two stories like ours. In this at axonometric drawing, you can again see how our proposal relates to our neighbors, this time in three dimensions. This slide indicates the view from Green Avenue, an adjacent street about 90 yards away. Technically, our extension will be visible through this gap in the buildings. In the existing view on the left, the addition at 115 St. James Place is partially discernible. In the middle image, we have included a rendering of our proposal. The two white rectangles frame enlarged views. The photograph at the right shows another existing extension that is closer to Green Avenue and more clearly visible. It is also clad in a dark material. Finally, here are existing and proposed plans of our project with the addition again highlighted in pink. Please let us know if you have any questions. Great, thank you very much for a very clear presentation. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Okay. Don't see any questions at this time. So we'll move to public testimony and we may have questions after that. Um, so if you're in the meeting and would like to testify on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Sasha Seeley who will take us through the testimony. Alrighty, thank you. Michelle Arbalu from Historic District Council. You should be receiving a request for me now. Okay, Michelle, I see you've accepted my request. Please just unmute your mic and state your name for the record. You can begin your testimony. You have three minutes. Hello, Michelle Arbu for the Historic Districts Council. HDC finds this addition to the rear yard to be generally appropriate. That said, we believe that using brick for the exterior of the building would be more in keeping with its neighbors. We find the proportion of fenestration to masonry to be a bit open. A somewhat large proportion of masonry to class would be, we believe, more an, a more elegant solution. Thank you. All right, let me just take a glance back over. And I do not see any more hands raised for this item. So I will just note for the record that Brooklyn Community Board 2 recommends approval of this application. And we have received letters of support from the Fort Greene Association, Clinton Hill Society, and Citizens for Responsible Neighborhood Planning. I will turn it back over to you, Chair Carroll. Okay, thank you. All right, um, so would you like to respond to the comments we've heard? I think that test the, uh, we have letters of support, but we know that we just heard testimony um, generally supporting the proposal, but questioning the proportions of the glazing. I don't know if that's something you'd like to address. Sure, I'm gonna let my uh, colleague Jess uh, speak on this. Okay, hi. just state your name for the, your full name for the record. Okay, hi, my name is Jess Henshaw. Um, I think when we looked at the various elevations, we wanted to treat these in two different ways. When you look straight on at the rear elevation, I think we do have some more historically sized windows with the three fixed windows, actually their casement. And then in this, yeah, so on the left-hand side, we're trying to have kind of more appropriately sized window bays with the, the masonry in between. On the right-hand side, we really wanted to create a feeling, uh, quite honestly, of an indoor outdoor experience with the kitchen. Also, we felt that from the visible street view, uh, this amount of glazing would actually make the building kind of recede more into the uh, vegetation and plants than if it were more masonry. Okay, thank you. And I think there was also a comment about the stucco, but you're just patching the existing stucco. Right? That, that's correct. All right. Um, commissioners, any final questions? I'm going to start to send you requests to unmute so we can go ahead and begin uh, our discussion after closing the hearing. So Commissioner Lutfi, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Goldblum, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Okay, the hearing's closed and we'll begin our discussion. And um, I wanna thank the applicant for providing a very clear presentation showing the immediate context, but also the larger context. And so uh, this edition is, you know, a mediating between two uh, different editions on either side of it. And uh, the applicant did show other two-story editions within the block. And um, with respect to the glazing, I think it, we can see that the commission has approved a variety of fenestration <laughs> patterns on additions in this block, just looking at the two adjacent additions. And we know that we have historically been more flexible about um, open, uh, uh, tra more transparent, fenestration designs in uh, two-story rear yard additions. So uh, with that, we'll begin our discussion. Commissioner Jefferson, would you like to start this one? Sure, sure. Uh, um, on a whole, I can approve the project. Um, some of the notes I took last night, I do agree that the, the window brick, window brick uh, facade it's a bit odd and it doesn't relate to the existing fabric, but I'm willing to accept it. I think the if they kept the windows similar to the to the side windows, it would be fine too. But either way, I can accept that. Um, and the and the visibility from the corridor, I can accept that. I think it's from a side street and there's uh, other projects are visible, so I can accept that. The, if you go back to the, the slide, I was just looking at it, and, and where the, the exterior space, this, it seems to me that there's a column missing. Maybe I'm wrong, but there's a column that holds up that, that exterior. Um, the deck piece? Yeah, deck, so I don't know, but maybe. Maybe I'm missing something. But anyway, um, I can accept the project. Okay. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Gustafson. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, I, I do it with what uh, your comment, uh, uh, Chair Carroll, about the presentation here gave us every comparison necessary uh, in terms of bulk height massing. It's fine. The fenestration is fine. It's actually less than some of the projects we've seen. Um, and, um, and I think it's, uh, the visibility is, uh, not only partial, it's minor. So, um, <coughs> I'm, I'm okay with it as is. Thank you. Commissioner Shamir Barron. I agree completely. Commissioner Chapin. Yeah, I agree with other commissioners. Uh, and I think it, uh, I like the way also that they fit in, uh, fit the project in, uh, between its neighbors, which is an, in, you don't see that kind of effort often. And I think it, it was well done in terms of uh, the massing of the project. So I can approve it as presented. Thank you, Commissioner Goldblum. I agree. I think it's, uh, I agree with what, <clears throat> what uh, Everardo said. I think it is, it does have awkward aspects to it, um, but I don't think those aspects um, modify its appropriateness. Uh, I think, I think the uh, urban, you know, calculations of this uh, trying to kind of negotiate between the two uh, elements that are already added in the back are, is, a, is not an uh, unreasonable approach to uh, the massing within, the, within this uh, donut. So I think it's appropriate. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Devonshire. I think it's a thoughtful approach and uh, I can approve it. Commissioner Bland. Um, I agree. I don't think I have much to add. I think it's appropriate. Commissioner Lutfi. I agree. I, I think it's very well done. I think the fact that the project um, steps back, it doesn't run the full depth. Um, is, it it helps. It actually, um, it's not, it doesn't look bulky and it actually gives them a lot more flexibility in terms of how they use both floors. I think it's very smart. Okay. Okay, thank you. So I think we have a consensus to approve. Commissioner Jefferson, would you be comfortable reading the motion? Sure, sure. <clears throat> In the matter of LPC-22-04976, one thirteen St. James Place, Clinton Hill Historic District, application is to construct a rear yard addition. I note that the building scale, style, material, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic 
character of Clinton Hill District. I recommend approval finding that the proposed work will not eliminate or damage any significant architectural features, that the addition will not rise to the full height of the building, thereby retaining a sense of building origin, original scale and massing, that the addition will not project further into the rear yard than the addition at the adjacent house, or uh, adjacent house, hmm. ah, where am I? Or eliminate the presence, or eliminate the presence of a rear yard, that the L-shaped massing of, of the addition will be keeping with the various variation of massing at the rear. rear but that the L-shaped massing of the addition will not will be keeping with the variation of massing at the rear extension within the block, and will help maintain a harmonious transition between the depth, the neighboring additions that the addition will be keeping with the character of the surviving secondary facade in terms of its solid to void ratio, material, and level of ornamentation, that the dark finish of the brick of the addition will be in keeping with variety of finishes found at secondary facade within this block, that the addition will only be partially visible from the public thoroughfare from a limited viewpoint at a significant distance and the design and detail of the addition were largely indiscernible with the varied context of the surrounding rear facades and extension. And, and the proposed work will not detract from the special architectural and historical character of the buildings and the Clinton Hill Historic District. Thank you. And Commissioner Gustafson, would you second that motion? Second. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. With nine in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. That's approved. Thank you. And we'll move to the next item. Next item is public hearing item number three, LPC 22-02672, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 326, lot 22, 19 Tompkins Place in the Cobble Hill Historic District. This is a Greek revival style row house built in the 1840s and the application is to construct a rear yard addition. Okay, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Uh, Matthew, you now have control of the presentation. You can, perfect. Please state your name for the record. Right. And <laughs> Thank you very much. So my name is Matthew Ransom. I am joined by my colleague, Benjamin Huckberg. We are from Overhead Architecture. And today we are presenting the non-visible horizontal enlargement at 19 Tompkins Place. Uh, so maybe perhaps a little bit surprisingly, these three photos depict the same building. So this is the 1940s tax lot photo of 19 Tompkins. The front facade here as it is today, you can see that, that not a lot has changed. And then here at the rear, uh, you can see that there is already an existing rear yard extension. It's partial width, it's two stories tall. And the proposal that we have before you today is the non-visible enlargement um, of this extension. We are proposing to um, widen it to take the full width of the building, and we are um, extending into the rear yard by about seven feet. We'll see this in more detail in just a moment. Um, this is just a brief overview of the, of the donut, of the block itself. Um, it's a very heterogeneic street. Um, so we're abutted by Court Street here. So there is a commercial district on the back side of our lot. Um, and then there's just a wide variety in terms of the housing stock on Tompkins Place itself. There's a mix of townhouses, apartment buildings, um, and I, I suppose duplexes. Um, these colors denote uh, the existing extensions that are in the block. Uh, the green denotes one story, orange is two, and then uh, blue is three. And we'll see this in more detail, but I'd like to call out here that um, just down the street from us, 25 Tompkins, there was a three story um, full width extension um, and actually underway now at 15 Tompkins, if you can see my cursor, um, there is there's also a three story extension. So there is precedent. Um, and this is the this is Tompkins as it is today. You can again, you'll see this in more detail, but there's a large wood deck that extends about halfway into the rear yard and then a partial width extension. 
Um, and then what we're proposing is, is basically just widening the enlargement and extending it back by, by seven feet. Um, here in just a little bit more detail, the block again. Um, so 15 Tompkins is the one that I mentioned two, two doors down. We at 19 Tompkins are illustrated here in orange. Uh, so it is a three-story extension, full width, and then just a few doors down, I guess three doors down at 25 Tompkins, we have a three-story um, full width extension. Um, this is just a landscape of, of uh, the interior of the donut. So we are here at the center of this 19 Tompkins. Looking left, that's the three-story double width extension. We are coming actually uh, no further into the rear lot than, uh, than this one here. So we kind of pan right. You can see that our neighbor, our immediate neighbor at 17 Tompkins uh, has a small addition. And then just a door down, um, this is actually a renovation that's underway. So presumably it was recently approved uh, before the commission, 15 Tompkins. And again, it's, it's a double width and um, three-story tall, or sorry, single width uh, and three-story tall extension. Uh, looking back from our house. So again, there's 25 Tompkins. Uh, and then here we can see uh, the commercial abutment um, along Court Street. So, you know, it's like I said, it's very heterogeneic block. There's, there's a lot going on. There's extensions, there's tall apartment buildings and so forth. It's a really dynamic block interior. Um, and you can also see just the, the nature of the, the rear deck. So um, we'll see that in a little bit more detail and elevation in just a moment. Um, and again, there's 15 Tompkins. So what are we proposing? So here at the top, this is the existing condition at 19 Tompkins. You can see here's the wood deck that I mentioned going about halfway into the rear yard. It is a very deep rear yard. Um, even after the existing extension, there's 52 feet. Um, and then here you can see in, in light gray, that is the existing extension that I mentioned. It's about nine feet deep. and It's about say half the width of, of the building itself. What we are proposing is widening the extension. We are I should say we are completely removing this extension and then the new, the proposed extension would be the full width of the building and it would be seven feet uh, deeper than, than the one that's there now, which would still leave about 45 feet to the rear lot line. Um, so it does maintain, um, it does maintain the, the kind of present um, volumetric feeling of, of the rear yard. Um, and in our feeling is that by removing this deck, it's actually making it a, a little bit less present in, in the block itself. I think that's borne out by the photos. And we'll see that again in, in just a moment in elevation. This is just to, to, to kind of further illustrate uh, the look and feel of the donut um, after this proposed extension uh, would be incorporated into the block. So here we are to 19 Tompkins and you can see it's, it's very heterogeneous block interior. Um, here we can see with a little bit more detail uh, the proposed extension. So as I mentioned at 25 Tompkins, that's the, the three-story full width extension, two doors down. Um, it comes about 19 feet into the yard, we're at 16, and then our neighbors beside uh, are 13 feet. And we're still maintaining quite a deep backyard at, at 48 feet. Um, this is a section through the existing, um, existing extension. You can see now a little better um, just the impact that this wood deck has it extends very deep in the backyard. Um, it's got a really heavy presence. And then of course the bright yellow extension is here. It's about nine feet deep. Um, I should also mention that there's a cut line through this section. So if we were to see this at scale, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the, the, the backyard would continue beyond. Um, what we are proposing again is, is a seven foot lengthening of that extension. It's gonna be full width. And then uh, we're proposing just, a, proposing just a simple stair uh, out to the rear yard. Um, and the intent with all of this is, is, to, is basically to stitch the, the building back together again, to make the, the extension feel part and parcel of the house itself, and thereby make the house feel uh, like it's part and parcel of the block and to better blend with the neighborhood. Here's a comparative analysis in the two sections. So we are proposing completely removing the existing extension, the wood deck, and then here's the, the proposed extension there. Um, in elevation, this is the existing condition at 19 Tompkins. Um, you've got the three-story extension there, two doors down, um, and the other one was just out of view. And then this is the, the proposed extension. Um, you can see, you know, some decisions have been my, made in, in the design of the fenestration um, to sort of 
provide something that's in better keeping with, with the, the texture of the block than perhaps the bright yellow uh, vinyl clad extension is now. Um, and and that's, that's really what this is all about, is just to kind of stitch the house back together again and just kind of really enfold, better enfold the house into the neighborhood. Um, here we can see this is the proposed demolition of the extension, and then you can see the widened uh, proposed extension here. The next slide, just a brief overview of how this materializes. Um, so the choices that we're making now are just about um, how, to, how to better blend it, right? So we're, we, we're working with earth tones, light grays, et cetera, to just really keep it um, with minimal impact on the block. And that's it. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Okay, I don't see any questions at this time. Oh, wait, we have one. Commissioner Jefferson, please go ahead. Oh, I think you might be muted. Just, yeah, accept the request to unmute. I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, on the second floor, uh, where you have the railing, is that deck accessible or is it? Um, it is, it is. Yes, thank you for asking. So we are dropping uh, these two window sills to provide uh, the ability to walk out onto the extension. So hence the handrail across. Um, we've been told that this is part of a, a staff level review. I'm happy to talk more about it now, but um, but yes, we're, we're proposing to, to drop the sills and to have a, um, a walkout over the new extension. Oh, thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right, so to be clear, should the commission approve the two-story rear yard addition, the staff later could approve dropping the sills at the two windows and installing the railing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, other questions? All right, so we will uh, move to testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to testify on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And uh, I'll turn it over to Sasha Sealy to take us through that testimony. Ready, thank you. Michelle Arbalu from Historic District Council. You should be receiving a request from me now. Okay, Michelle, I see you've accepted my request. Please just unmute your mic, state your name for the record and you can begin your testimony. You have three minutes. Hello, Michelle Arbalu for the Historic Districts Council. HDC finds this addition to be appropriate, but would ask the commission to require brick as the exterior facade material. This will blend more favorably with its neighbors. Thank you. Thank All you. right, thank you. Lance over, Christina Conroy from Victorian Society, New York. All right, Christine, I see you've accepted my request. Please just unmute your mic and state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Uh, good morning, commissioners. I'm Christina Conroy for the Victorian Society, New York. Now, founded in New York City in 1966, the Victorian Society in America is dedicated to fostering the appreciation and preservation of our 19th and early 20th 20th century heritage. The New York chapter promotes preservation of our historic districts, individual landmarks, interiors, and civic art. Although this theater postdates the period of interest oh, for the- Christina, this, this is for 19 Tompkins Place. Whoops. Uh, yeah, okay. Nine. All right. Yes. I am on, okay, I'll see you later. Yes, you're on the next item, don't worry. Okay. Sorry, guys. No worries. All right, let me just take a glance back over and I do not see any more hands raised for this item. So I will just note for the record that Brooklyn Community Void 6 recommends approval with the condition that the railing at the top of the extension be simple wrought iron painted black and that the stair railing from the parlor floor to the yard be simple wrought iron painted black. And I will turn it back over to you, Chair Carroll. Okay, thank you very much, Sasha. Okay, so we heard testimony about the material of the addition, and while the railing could be eligible for staff level, there were comments about the, from the community board about the railing for the lower decks. So would you like to address either of those? Um, sure. So I, I think we during the community board meeting, um, 
you know, came up that actually this is this is one of the sticking points that they have often with these buildings is that, um, you know, there's there are often proposed novel designs for stair railings and handrails and so forth. And they're of the mind, um, as I understand it, that it's it's far better to just, you know, just be in keeping with with the rest of the neighborhood to, to not try and reinvent the wheel. That's completely fine. I think our intent um, in with the, with the color palette here, it's just to just to get it all to a certain level, just to kind of lighten everything up and get it to recede a bit. So our intent with having the lighter, like a lighter gray paint color of the guardrail at the top of the parapet was just to get it to blend in with the with the extension and with the the house behind it, rather than standing out as a as a decorative piece of metal. Um, you know, I think if 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 you all agree that it ought to be black, then obviously that's not a problem for us. It's um, you know it's more about the extension itself. But in terms of the decisions that we were making um, with respect to the materials, it was all just to to just kind of lighten everything and thereby kind of minimize the impact um, uh, on the character of the block. Okay, and your upper floors are stucco, so the lower floors were intended to relate to that. It, it, yeah, it would be the self same color. Okay. And are there other stucco clad additions? I mean, I know your current edition is a yellow vinyl sided <laughs> edition, but are there other stucco clad additions? Often there are, and we can see that. I, I think it's slide six, I believe, um, maybe a little bit later in the presentation. Um, there, there's precedent. And in fact, I think 15 Tompkins going in now uh, is, I believe, a stucco uh, extension, though I might be proven wrong if we, we've got the photo record here, so we can just revert back to that. So it, it does appear that, I mean, our immediate neighbor appears to be painted brick. Um, on the right side, there, there are other stucco additions. If you see 25 Tompkins off to the far left-hand side, that is a brick extension. Um, but I think it stands out in the block um, uh, for, ha for, for having that material. Okay, yeah. And I, and I will say the commission has certainly approved stucco clad additions in other rear yard uh, contexts. Okay, um, commissioners, any final questions? All right, I'm starting to send you a request to unmute you so we can move to our discussion. So, Commissioner uh, Devonshire, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Lutfi. Would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, aye. say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, <coughs> So the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. Um, this is also a two-story rear yard addition that is set back further, set back from the plane of the current deck, which puts set back deeper than the current addition by seven feet, but less than the current deck. Um, but these are deep yards, so it leaves a, a 48 foot rear yard. And um, I think we've heard largely supportive testimony, but some comments on the materials, are really the finishes, the materials. So um, we'll begin our discussion. Commis Commissioner Gustafson, Gustafson, would you start this one? Uh, yeah, sure. This, this To me, this seems like a, a quite an easy one. Um, I, I think that it's appropriate as is. I think the demolition of what's there isn't any kind of problem at all. Um, <clears throat> uh, the height is uh, is uh, appropriate at two stories. The, um, the, the, uh, the depth is consistent with what else is out there. Uh, I don't have a problem with the materials. I think it's, it's fine as is. Um, but if everybody else wants to go another direction, I'm, um, I'm sure I'll be okay with that as well. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Shamir Barron. I agree with Commissioner Gustafson again and uh, think that it is uh, appropriate on every level as presented. Thank you. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yes, I also agree with uh, the two previous commissioners that I think that the um, you know, stucco is an appropriate material. You know, the railings in black might be a little more traditional, but I don't think uh, I don't really have a problem with a different color of the railing. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Goldblum. Uh, no disagreement here. I think it's uh, uh, modest and appropriate. Commissioner Devonshire. Appropriate as presented. Commissioner Bland. I fall right in with everybody else. It's appropriate as presented. Okay. Commissioner Lutfi. 
I think it's appropriate. Um, I actually hadn't thought about the railing. I think I would have a slight preference for gray or black, but I can go with it as it is. Commissioner Jefferson. Appropriate, and I think the, the railings could be gray. Okay. All right, so I think uh, we have enough to vote for it as is. The applicant can continue to think about the railing, darkening the railing color if they wish, but I think we have enough to support it as is. So we'll uh, go ahead and make that motion. Commissioner Gustafson, would you make the motion? In the matter of LPC 22-026729 Tompkins Place in the Cobble Hill Historic District, the application is to construct a rear yard addition. I note that the building style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Cobble Hill Historic District. I recommend approval, noting that the demolition of the existing rear yard addition will not remove any significant architectural features, that the proposed rear yard, rear yard addition will not be visible from any public thoroughfare, that the addition will not rise to the full height of the building, thereby retaining a sense of the building's original scale and massing, and relationship with other houses in the row. That the proposed two-story addition will maintain the height of the existing addition and will not overwhelm this or the neighboring buildings, some of which have taller additions. That the depth of the addition will be consistent with other large rear yard additions existing within the block in and will, and will not diminish the central green space. That the design of the rear yard addition featuring a stucco finish to match the existing rear facade and multi-light metal window and door assemblies will harmonize with the house and other rear yard additions within the block. And that the work will not detract from the special architectural or historic character of the house or the historic district. All right, and uh, Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you second that motion? Second. All right, Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Ludfi. Aye. Nine in favor, none opposed. The motion passes. That's approved. Thank you. And we'll move to the next item. Thank you all very much. Okay, the next item is public hearing item number four, LPC 22-06827, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 1103, lot 27. A neo-Renaissance style theater building designed by Harrison G. Wiseman and Magnuson and Kleinert Associates and built in 1928. And the application is to install solar panels. I don't know that I mentioned the address, so I'll say it again if I didn't. Or if I did, 187 to 191 Prospect Park West, Sanders, now Pavilion Theater in the Park Slope Historic District Extension. Hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. On how you now have control of the presentation, you can advance the slides using your arrow keys or your mouse. Uh, please state your name for the record and you may begin. Hello, my name is Angel Ayon. I'm the principal of Ayon Studio Architecture and Preservation, and I'm delighted to be here to be presenting the photovoltaic uh, rooftop installation at the Nighthawk Prospect Park. <laughs> the uh, Nighthawk Prospect Park is on Prospect Park West. Um, it's within the boundaries of the Prospect Park Historic District Extension and just across the street from the uh, Park Slope Historic District on the corner of 14th Street in Prospect Park West. This is, apologies. This is a historic photo of the original building circa 1928 and its original incarnation as the Sanders Theater, um, as is still shown on the original marquee. Uh, what's important about this photo wrap is just that it tells that the building as it is to it today, and as we know, it has pretty much very consistent with its original incarnation, the, the, the larger uh, uh, large uh, bulk of the building has been, from its original days, has been in place and almost uh, unaltered uh, over the years. Here, subsequent photograph of the building evolution over the years in the 1940, you can see that the building remained pretty much the same than, than its original appearance from the 1920s. And in the 1980, that photograph show pretty much the same with the exception of some changes in the marquee that had been redone to uh, show the building in its uh, incarnation at that time at the 
Sanders Theater with a, a new uh, marquee. This is the building as it appeared to be a few years ago. Uh, it had been at that point of the, in the 70s, it was converted into the pavilion and the marquee again suffered an alteration. But other than that, the building remained pretty much in, intact. Um, it was about that time in 2015 when the commission review and approve an, a proposed alteration to the building that included not only uh, the installation of new windows on the north facade, but a rooftop addition visible from the street, um, from both the north facade on 14th Street, but also uh, from the roundabout. Uh, the application at the time also included a new building at the adjacent lot. This application was not pursued, but it's a, a, a relevant precedent that we just wanted to uh, note. As we all know, the building was converted in 2018 to the current Nighthawk Cinema. Uh, at that time, there were a couple of alterations regarding, regarding to the marquee and the extension of the elevator bulkhead that were also approved by the commission at public hearing. What's important is just that this photograph shows the existing roof that is visible from the, um, um, the roundabout. Um, this is not something that you can see in the original photograph, but it's, it's a very visible roof. And, this bulkhead is also an existing condition that was also shown on the 1944 photograph. Apologies again. This is the building in its current um, Okay, sorry, I'm having trouble with Is it delayed for you on how? Yes, I, I, I just have to give you some time. Okay. okay. All right, apologies. No this worries. Is in its current configuration, we are in the middle of doing repair work uh, that had been approved at staff level on the south facade and the, the front facade of the building. So there's scaffolding in, in place. <laughs> but the building uh, remains the same. The next slides show the building roof. On the left, you see a, of, of the view, a view looking east towards Prospect Park, and uh, it's showing the existing building, uh, the existing roof configuration. In essence, there are four, four um, uh, this is a segmented roof with four sides. And what we're planning to do is just install photovoltaics on these two middle segments of the roof that are a little bit flatter on that steeper side Facing, facing south um, on, on, on that you can barely see on this right hand side of the photograph. The photograph to the right is just the same roof looking west where the building pretty much and the, that segmented roof kind of ends at this location and then the roof configuration changes. This is the roof plan uh, showing the proposed, the proposed installation. This is a commercial type installation, uh, photovoltaic installation. It's a little bit different than what you would see on, on the, the typical residential installation. The panels are larger. They're about um, um, 90 inches long, slightly larger than the panels that you would see on a typical residential installation. And uh, the, this is a windowless uh, building with uh, a very high, uh, electricity uh, uh, use um, for the commercial kitchen and also all the existing six uh, uh, rooms. So this is an installation that would really help to ameliorate the electrical loads on the building. And, um, and we're trying to do, uh, maximize the use of the existing roof as possible to provide the new photovoltaic installation. The, these are uh, the existing and proposed elevations showing how we're planning to, to, to lay out the photovoltaics pretty much on this flatter roof that I mentioned before, but also on the south facing roof of the, the, the segmented roof. Um, we're trying to follow the existing roof line and, and trying to, uh, stay, to, keep the, to retain the, the proposed photovoltaic panels just as close as possible to the existing roof so that they are um, not as visible. 
This is the north facade, existing and proposed north facade, showing how those panels on the northern um, um, uh, uh, segment of that roof, they will be slightly visible, uh, but there will be no installation on the steeper side on the north facade. This is the south facade showing that uh, we're proposing to install panels on both sides of this existing bulkhead on the steeper side of the roof, but also on the flatter part of the roof as well. Um, and again, these are section building sections looking in the opposite direction, showing the photovoltaic panel layout very close to the existing roof uh, profile. This is the um, um, photovoltaic installation detail that we're proposing. Um, and in essence, we're proposing a, an extensive amount of uh, short supports to try to keep those panels as close as possible to the, uh, the existing roof. It's about 10 and a quarter inch maximum height, the maximum height that those panels will have above the replacement roof um, uh, surface. These are photographs of the, the modules that we are proposing. Um, and, and, and the photograph on the right just shows those modules installed at a different building in Brooklyn, not with the same configuration that we're proposing here. This, this is just um, provided just for illustrative purposes, just so that you have a sense of the look and feel of those modules uh, as they are being used in a similar, um, in, a, in a different location. A variety of views that we'll be showing you um, now, just so that you get a sense of the visibility of this proposed installation from various uh, viewpoints. Let's just start with um, a view from across the street from the building, uh, across on, on the opposite side of Prospect, Prospect Park West. If you were to just look at the building straight on, given that you have this very tall parapet, you will not be able to see the photovoltaic panels at all. So there will be no change and there will be no risk. There will not be visible from this location. You will have to move um, closer to the roundabout to start seeing that bulkhead roof that I was talking about initially, that that's when the roof start to be shown. And then the roof, the, the proposed work is just to pretty much cover most of that south facing roof with the, uh, uh, the photovoltaic installation. Another view further back from the roundabout um, showing the, the full roof with the proposed photovoltaic installation covering most of that area. And this is a view standing in the middle of the roundabout that shows the building in, in with more uh, clarity and what it's closer to have maximum visibility where you can see the existing roof more clearly exposed and the proposed photovoltaic configuration at that area. And this is uh, a closer view into the roundabout showing now, uh, passing the trees and showing now the full south facade and the uh, full building uh, roof and, and a render showing how that photovoltaic configuration will look like from that area once you get into the roundabout and um, past the trees. We're showing the existing condition with the scaffold and a render showing the proposed uh, uh, photovoltaic installation and all the restorative work that has already been approved by the commission and staff. Level. And then this is another view on Prospect Park West, uh, across the street on the side park, on the park side of the, 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 the street, that shows that it, there is one particular spot where if you, if you stand there, you will be able to see the, the edge of the uh, northernmost uh, installation that it's about, as I said before, 10 and a quarter inch above the roof surface, but that will be visible at that location from the sidewalk. And I will stop here. All right, thank you very much. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Okay, I don't see any questions at this time. So we'll move to testimony. You're in the meeting and would like to testify on this item. Please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Sasha to take us through the testimony. Thank you. Christina Conroy from Victorian Society, New York. You should be receiving a request right now. Okay, Christina, I see you've accepted my request. Please just unmute your mic and state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Okay. Um, 
Good morning again, commissioners. Okay, I'm still Christina Conroy for the Victorian Society New York. Now founded in New York City in 1966, the Victorian Society in America is dedicated to fostering the appreciation and preservation of our 19th and early 20th century heritage. The New York chapter promotes preservation of our historic districts, individual landmarks, interiors, and civic art. Although this theater postdates the period of interest for the Victorian Society, the roof changes proposed have their most significant impact on the adjacent Victorian era Prospect Park scenic landmark. Now the small portions of the roof that project into view are visible only from some distance and appear to be painted by tumulus uh, material and don't contribute to the architectural character of the building or historic district. The increase in visibility caused by the proposed slight increase in height and the substitution of photovoltaic panels for the utilitarian roofing material do not seem to us to affect the character of the building, call undue attention, or detract from the quality of views from Prospect Park and the surrounding streets. Therefore, in this unusual case, the Victorian Society supports the proposed addition of visible photovoltaic panels. Thank you. Thank you. Let me take a glance back over the attendees and see if we have anyone else who wishes to speak on this item. And I do not see any hands raised, so I will just note for the record that Brooklyn Community Board 6 recommends approval of this application, and I'll turn it back over to you, Chair Carroll. Great. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so Angel, it was very supportive testimony, but um, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to address or any final comments you'd like to make. Uh, no, uh, except that we've, we've gone through uh, uh, um, um, we went through a, 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 a lot of deal to try to minimize the visibility of this very visible uh, installation. And, and the way that we're trying to do so is just by trying to keep it very close to, to the roof surface. Um, if, it, if this were to be any other building, it would have a very different type of support. It would have been a little bit closer, supported by larger beams of donage. And uh, in this case, it's a little bit counter counterintuitive what we're doing. We're adding more support just so that we can keep it flatter and closer to the roof surface. And I think this is this is um, uh, a really interesting case also in, that allows all of us to, to kind of like strike the right balance between preservation and sustainability and, and doing an alteration to the building that is visible, but hopefully uh, appropriate. Okay, thank you. And commissioners, if, if there are no final questions, uh, we'll start to go ahead and unmute so we can close the hearing and begin our discussion. Oh, Commissioner Jefferson, did you have a question? Please go ahead. Commissioner Jefferson, just accept the request to unmute. Thank you again. The ball spot on the right hand image at the front or at the front, could that be covered up by photovoltaic? In the elevation, you see? Yeah. Um, you're not the only one who doesn't remember how to, to unmute, so <laughs> you're not <laughs> um, We need to leave uh, a six foot clearance from the building, the front facade for the okay. fire department to get access into the roof. Okay. Um, and that is the reason why that has not been covered. Um, thank you, thank you. I, okay. I can see. Yeah. Great. Any other final questions? Okay, I'm not seeing any other final questions. So we'll make a motion to close the hearing. Commissioner Bland, would you make a motion to close the hearing? We'll move. Thank <coughs> you. And Commissioner Lutfi, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. Um, and so we have recently seen a number of applications for solar panels or photovoltaic uh, panels on um, buildings, various buildings in our historic districts. Um, this has, you know, it's interesting as a theater, the back portion of it is is as typical of theaters, very utilitarian, and it has a sort of um, hip angled roof, which um, in some ways lends itself to the angles for, needed for uh, the solar 
panel. So um, it's an interesting application here. And I think as, as Angel, the applicant had pointed it out, it's, um, I think this is a, a nice example as we think about how preservation and sustainability goals can be very aligned and work closely together. Um, Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you begin this one? Yes. Um, thank you. I, I really appreciate the presentation, which I thought was so clear and um, and interesting. And it's and it's very interesting as well to see this amount of kind of um, surface that this amount of square footage of, of um, photo, photovoltaics this kind of scale, and also on an sort of an, an institutional building. Um, very interesting to see. Uh, I, I absolutely agree with the applicant that, that, that this does in fact, or with, uh, agree with his intention to strike a balance and think that in fact it does strike that balance, as you said, Chair Carroll, between uh, preservation, sustainability, and the kind of the marriage of the two um, on lots of levels, the retention of the building, the, you know, the, the, re, the use again of the building, you know, rather than losing the building, finding a way to bring it into the future, um, accept the visibility because and, and all of the efforts that they've made to allow for it to be as flat as possible, that kind of extra work that was done in order to build structure for it to be flat. But it, it I mean, it reads very intentionally. And I think that the intention does not detract from the historic quality of the building. It kind of, again, takes it into the future in a positive way. Thank you. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yeah, I I think that uh, you know these are allowing these uh, uh, climate change uh, you know additions to buildings is is very important. Uh, obviously, our mission is to decide whether they detract from the building, mm -hmm. and in this case, I think that uh, it it is as the Victorian Society testimony indicated. I think that it is actually. Uh, fine and will not uh, detract from, from this historic building. So I can... Thank you. Commissioner Goldblum. Couldn't agree more. Um, I think that, I mean, I look at solar panels like, like I look at uh, ADA ramps. Um, these are signs of our progress. <clears throat> these are signs of our progress as a city and a civilization towards a better way of living. Um, and so I think there's, they're actually lovely to look at. Um, I also think that it's, uh, as has been noted, I think it's wonderful that, that this building is, is finding a way into the future, which rather few uh, uh, outer, you know, kind of uh, non Times Square uh, movie theaters uh, have been able to do. Um, and uh, I think fostering the use along with the structure is a, a benefit to the community and a benefit to the city. Um, uh, my partner would kill me if, if I didn't say that the, uh, the building in the foreground certainly is a, is a contribution as well, but we're not talking about that one. So uh, I think it's totally appropriate. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Devonshire. Yeah, I, I pass by this roof a couple of times a week, just walking around and it's possibly the most hideous roof in Park Slope. I love seeing it covered with something that will benefit the theater and the neighborhood and civilization. Good job, Angel. Thank you, Commissioner Bland. Well, there's not much <laughs> more to add to the uh, kudos uh, for Angel on this one. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, it actually improves the look of the, of the, uh, of the roof appreciably. <clears throat> uh, never mind the good for society that it's doing. Uh, as well, which is more important, I think, in this case, but it does improve the look, cleans it up. Great, great story. Thank you. Commissioner Lutby. I happen to agree. I want to just uh, add on to what Commissioner Devonshire and Bland said, because I see this, this building all the time, and the roof is a little bit of an eyesore, and it's, it's so nice to know that they are doing something that is not gonna have visually a negative impact. It's very discreet. And that in terms of renewable energy, it's, it's gonna be a very, very positive contribution 
to the building and our society. And I want to also just say that this theater over the has had a lot of ups and downs over the past, I mean, at least 20 years. And it's so heartening to know that, and I've seen the progress being made on so many fronts and, and that this is yet another positive step forward in a, a, a neighborhood institution that uh, people frequent and uh, rely on, so. Great, thank you. Commissioner Jefferson. I agree with all the comments. Okay, Commissioner Gustafson? Yeah, appropriate as is. Okay, so I think again, we have a consensus to approve. Um, Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you make the motion? Yes. In the matter of LPC 2206827, 187, 191, Prospect Park West, Sanders Now Pavilion Theater, Park Slope Historic District, a neo-Renaissance style theater building designed by Harrison G. Wiseman and Magnuson and Kleiner Associates and built in 1928, the application is to install solar panels. I note the building style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Park Slope Historic District extension. I also note the visibility and the installation of solar panels on pitched roofs may be unavoidable in cases such as this one due to code requirements, site conditions, and the necessity of panels to face south for proper performance and economic viability, and that large commercial grade panels are required at commercial buildings to achieve sufficient performance and economic viability. I recommend approval, finding that the proposed work will not damage or eliminate any significant architectural or historic feature of the building, features of the building, that the solar panels will only be seen from public thoroughfares in minimal views above the primary facade and against the background of the utilitarian roof in views on and above the south side of the roof, that the uniform size placement and finish of the panels set low and oriented to the pitch of the existing visible roof will have a discrete presence as seen within the context of a variety of rooftop, rooftop accretions on this building. That the installation will be reversible in the long term and clearly discernible as a modern assembly providing renewable energy that supports the sustainability of the historic building. And the proposed work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the building or the Park Slope Historic District Extension. Thank you, Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. With nine in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. That's approved and we'll move to the next item. Thank you. And the next item is public hearing item number five, LPC 22-06681, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 5190, lot 32, 362 East 25th Street and East 25th Street Historic District. This is a Renaissance revival style row house designed by Glucroft and Glucroft and built in circa 1909 to 12. The application is to replace a door. Hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. The staff will be walking you through the presentation. Um, Caroline, you now have control of the presentation. You just need to click on your screen and then you may begin. Thank you, Abby. Good morning, commissioners. Caroline Passion, preservation staff. The application before you today is the placement of the existing door at the front facade that was present at the time of designation. This row house is located on the west side of the block uh, between Clarendon Road and Avenue D. It is one of a row in 28 on this side of the street uh, in this historic district that was designated in November of 2020. The original doors uh, of this row house and the other houses within this row and within this district uh, were wood and glass double leaf doors seen in this historic tax photograph. And by the time of designation, the historic doors had been replaced. 
So the store replacement is being reviewed by the commissioners today because the new doors will not match the historic doors in terms of configuration materials and details. The applicant is proposing to remove the existing aluminum door and to install a fiberglass uh, panel door, um, which will feature a door, uh, I mean, sorry, a window, and then the side panels, the side metal panels and infill at the top will be cladded over with extruded aluminum panning. And I, both the door and uh, the panning will be all painted in a black finish. It'll be a factory um, applied painted finish to match. Uh, this is a rendering of the proposed door. There will be panels with a window um, at the top of the door. And this is just a few streetscape photos to show uh, the existing doors at the houses on this block and across the street within the district. Uh, most of the historic doors uh, had been replaced by the time of designation, um, and they all feature uh, single leaf doors with um, infill within the existing openings. Uh, and so commissioners, uh, please note that the daughter of the homeowner, Terry Simmons, is here if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Caroline. So commissioners, do we have any questions at this time? All right, I don't see any questions right now, so we'll move to testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to testify on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you, and I will turn it over to Sasha Seely to take us through the testimony. Thank you. Michelle Arbalu from Historic District Council, you should be receiving a request for me now. Okay, Michelle, I see you've accepted my request. Please just unmute your mic and state your name for the record. Michelle Arbalu for the Historic Districts Council. The pair of wood and glass doors shown in the tax photo and in evidence on other buildings on this block is the appropriate appro approach for replacing these doors. We would note that the strength of glass that is now standard in exterior doors should provide sufficient security for the owner of this handsome building. We would also note that the inner single wood opaque door with side lights could provide an added layer of security to the entry. Thank you. Thank you. Christina Conroy from Victorian Society in New York. You should be receiving a request from me now. Okay, Christina, I see you've accepted my request. Just unmute your mic and state your name for the record and then you can begin your testimony. Okay, good morning again, commissioners. I'm Christina Conroy for the Victorian Society in New York. Now, there are 56 houses built by the same developer in this district, all of a similar size, scale, height, and detailing. A site visit by BSNY revealed that 20 of the 56 still have paired doors, most historic and most with large areas of glass. We believe that this was the original design for all the houses. Now, this appears to be the first application in this district for door replacement. The results of the commission's determination will set a precedent here, either a good one or a bad one. The appropriate solution is to replicate the historic wood paired glazed doors. If there are concerns about privacy or security, shades, obscure glass or interior grills can be added. There may be a single leaf door solution that could be appropriate, if not ideal, but it would require a door of the right style and height and a much better treatment of a side and top panel infill than the plain aluminum cladding proposed. Thank you. All right, thank you. Let me just take a glance back over at the attendees. See if we have any more hands raised. And I do not see anyone else who wishes to speak on this item. So I'll just note for the record that Brooklyn Community Board 17 recommends approval for this application. And I will turn it back over to you, Chair Carroll. Thank you very much, Sasha. Okay, so I, I think I just wanna clarify something and then I'll, I'd like to ask the applicant rep representative if she'd like to respond to the comments. But the um, we do know that the historic configuration would have been a double leaf door. In this case, the applicant is only proposing to replace the operable door portion and they are keeping the enframement and recladding it. So the, 
what is before us is not a full replacement. It's a replacement of just the operable piece and then how the enframement is treated. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, we would be in with a limited scope like that, we would be looking at the door and then that treatment. Um, but I'd like to ask the applicant if uh, she'd like to uh, respond or add any additional comments. Is the applicant here, Caroline? Yes, Miss Simmons, uh, I see you're unmuted, so you can speak. If you'd like to add any comments. And if I, I don't want to move on without giving you that opportunity, but so if you, whether or not you'd like to speak, just let us know what, if you prefer to speak or not. Ms. Simmons? I wonder if there's a technology problem. We had a, um, we practiced in Zoom yesterday and there was a little bit of trouble. So it, that might be the case, even though uh, I could see that she is present here in the Zoom meeting. Okay. All right. So um, do you have an, e an email address or a way to reach out to her? I'm going to reach out now. Okay, great. I just want her to have the opportunity to explain the rationale and choices that were made. Even if she emails you her, her feedback or texts okay. her feedback to you, we can relay it. Okay. Okay, uh, she, so the daughter of the homeowner, Terry Simmons, um, has said that uh, she just wanted to say it's just the door and nothing else changes. Um, she also said that she um, did unmute, but that um, we just can't hear her at the moment. Okay, all right, great, thank you. And commissioners, are there any final questions? All right, I'm going to start to send you requests to unmute so we can move to close the hearing and begin our discussion. Okay. And Commissioner Bland, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Devonshire, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. And, um, you know, this is, as you know, a district that, that we just recently designated and it has a, a, in, an incredible sense of place by virtue of its really consistent bow fronted row houses um, and they're consistent in their size and detailing mat uh, materials and um, and it, it really is quite striking how consistent they are, even though half of them have replacement doors. Um, and so in this case, uh, and I would say there are also some other interesting uh, change, even historically some buildings had balustrades and some didn't, and that's still the case today, although less have the balustrade on top. Um, but otherwise, it's sort of the primary consistency is really driven by these rows of uh, limestone facades with these curved bays that project. Um, and so um, what we're seeing today is a proposal to replace the door. And as we explained, the scope is really limited to just the door, not the enframement. So while we know the historic condition would be a double leaf door, and that would be uh, approved at staff level, this is before us today because they're not able to do a double leaf door within the size of the opening. So we'll be discussing the door and then the treatment of the enframement around it. Um, so we'll begin our discussion. Commissioner Chapin, do you, would you like to start this one? Uh, yes. Um, I, 
I, of course, I would like to see, uh, you know, uh, something much closer to the original door. At the same time, what's being presented to us is the replacement of an existing door with a door that will be, uh, I think, working with the staff could be more appropriate than it currently is. So while the ideal would be uh, something else, I think that uh, replacing the door, working with the staff on the profiles and, and, and the surround and so forth would achieve uh, a better condition that in the, if someone in the future is doing a more extensive renovation could be replaced. And I don't think it will prevent us in other situations where someone may be re re replacing more of the surround uh, from going uh, back much closer to the original. So I can uh, approve it as long as uh, the applicant works with his staff on the, uh, the trim and the moldings and the, you know, the presentation of the door in general. Great, thank you. And I think, you know, the fiberglass door will have a factory applied painted finish. So that will, uh, I think the change in, mat in that material will not be perceptible, but I agree the flat enframement could be enhanced with some profile or molding that could be worked out with the staff. Um, Commissioner Goldblum. Um, I agree with what Diana said. I, I think that this is a step in the right direction. It's not a, uh, um, a, a restoration of the historic condition, but one sees a lot of uh, replacement doors in, in buildings of this vintage. Um, and um, I think that uh, uh, the way that the enframement is trimmed out will go a long way towards um, contributing to the, uh, ac not accuracy, but the, the historic appropriateness of, of the entire installation. One thing that I would suggest that they look at because of the thickness of that surround is adding uh, decorative trim that's consistent with the uh, style of the building uh, and also trying to minimize the inset of the door. Um, when you buy a door like that, it usually comes pre-hung on a frame and you can pick the thickness of the frame. So um, I would suggest that they try to pick something that's, that's very uh, shallow and uh, that allows the door and whatever enframement details are worked out with the staff to be relatively um, flush. Uh, it'll just make for a better looking installation that's more kind of typical of, of historic installations and also closer to what was there originally, which were two panels that were in the same plane with each other. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Devonshire? I agree with Michael's comments. Okay, Commissioner Bland. I'm sorry, I can't get with the program here. Um, I appreciate that this is a new district and et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, but I think we would never approve something like this in Greenwich Village or Upper East Side or Upper West Side. I'm sorry to say these things, but I just, I find that uh, a fiberglass door with pre-finished paint on it is that looks like a suburban house right out of a catalog. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't get with the program. Okay, Commissioner Lutfi. Um, I have to agree with Fred. Um, you know, I, I was thinking, well, I could say working with staff, but I'm not quite sure it would bring the door and the surround to a place that makes sense in this new historic district. And it's being done now. It's not going to be changed within the next two years. So I would, um, I, I feel that it needs to be closer to what we would normally approve. Okay. I mean, I, I think that um, short of being able to do a double door, we would probably focus on the details of that enframement. And I think that's something I'd have confidence in the staff being able to work out. Okay, Commissioner Jefferson. 
Um, I agree with Fred. And um, I, I think that if the door didn't have that curved transom, I think it's a transom, I'm not sure. I mean, if it was square perhaps, but most of my agreement is with Fred and the Victorian Society. Commissioner Gustafson. Yeah, uh, I, I, I'm in the bland camp here. Um, the uh, uh, doors are gonna be critical on this block. It is um, absolutely a, a, a tremendous um, uh, grouping of buildings. And, um, and, and when you walk down that street, um, that's the thing that catches your eye. That's the inconsistency that catches your eye. Um, and so um, I, I think Fred is right. It's good. We would not have, we would not accept this in, an, in another district that has similar buildings with such consistency. So um, I, I can't accept it here. Okay, Commissioner Shamir Barron. Uh, I think I agree with Commissioner Bland, but I'm wondering if um, what exactly the you know what we what we would potentially improve in other situations. I, I think the, I mean, I think it should be a war, but I, I think that the bigger problem is the transom. And the transom seems um, sort of, as, as Commissioner Bland said, off the shelf and slightly suburban. And so maybe if it were to follow a little bit more the, the form of some of the other transoms, either much bigger or much smaller, but rectangular, um, that might be helpful. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I do want to ask you, Chair Carroll, what your thoughts are about, about the fiberglass itself and the extent to which we, we are wanting to consider that as a material for other, other districts. Yeah, I mean, we have approved it, not a lot, but we have approved it um, at, on doors. Um, I mean, I can remember uh, one or two times in Sunnyside Gardens where we've approved it as a front door material in lieu of wood. Um, and we've certainly also approved it as a window replacement material. So I think the finish is pro uh, probably very critical in understanding or being able to sort of read the or not perceive the change in material. Um, but I think it's something that, you know, perhaps a finished sample might be helpful next time. And just to add, I mean, it will have simulated joinery and paneling and things like that, but uh, it can be brush painted on top of a factory prime coat or other finish. So in that sense, it may not be so different in terms of its outer appearance seen from more of a distance from the street as any other material that's, that's brush painted. Have we ever approved this sort of size door in a in fiberglass in in another district like in Brooklyn Heights or well th this size door is not actually that different from the ones in Sunnyside Gardens which were also single doors um, we have so you know we have done fiberglass on this size door I would say though for um, I don't I don't know about every other brownstone historic district but I would say that we certainly have dealt with the issue of not being able to return to a double leaf door because the scope was limited to, you know, the single operable door replacement. And, um, and you know, we've dealt with the treatment to around the enframement in those instances. Yeah, so I guess my perspective is um, if others could agree to the fiberglass again, it's not my, um, what I think is most appropriate, but uh, I do think that it's the transom that's the problem and needs to change or go away entirely. Okay. All right, so I think we'll take no action today and we'll ask the applicant to continue to work with the staff on um, the, the detailing and particularly focusing on the enframement in the transom area and, um, and maybe also thinking about providing a finish sample um, and exploring a brushed finish on top of the factory applied finish to see how that looks. And we'll have them back when they're ready. So we'll take no action today. All right, thank you. We'll move to the next item. All right, the next item is public hearing item number six, LPC 22-07210 an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 828, lots 20 and 19. This is 21 to 23 West 26th Street, 
and the Madison Square North Historic District. A Queen Anne style office building designed by Thomas Stent and built in 1880 to 81, and a colonial revival style office building originally built in 1880 to 81 and altered circa 1922 by Peabody, Wilson, and Brown. And the application is to construct rooftop and rear yard additions. Okay, hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Um, Ethan, you now have control of the presentation. You just need to click on your screen. Perfect. Um, you can advance the slides using your arrow keys or your mouse. Uh, please state your name for the record and you may begin. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Benjamin Bischoff. I'm the applicant and I have Ethan Pomerantz, who is the project manager for the project. Um, as summarized by Corey, the project involves the renovation and expansion of two existing three-story office buildings at 21 to 23 West 26th Street to be combined into a single building to serve as the office and headquarters of our client. Um, the buildings have significant history as they were originally constructed for John Jacob and Vincent Astor to serve as the offices for their respective real estate operations. I know we don't have the time today to detail that history, but I want to acknowledge that the history of the buildings, both architecturally and commercially, was a major attraction in purchasing the buildings uh, by our client. Uh, and there is the desire to um, preserve as much as possible, including a lot of uh, significant interior details and woodwork and the bank vault at number 21, which is largely in historic original condition. Uh, both on the interior and the exterior, the renovation work that we are presenting is designed to be modest and respectful of the history and character of the original buildings including restoration of some deteriorated and altered facade features to their historic conditions, which we are being, uh, which we are coordinating with uh, staff at staff level. Um, the proposed additions we are presenting today are motivated by contemporary office needs, including the addition of an elevator in the rear to serve both buildings and a fourth floor extension at number 23 to create a space large enough to accommodate meetings and conferences for the 100 person uh, office occupancy. Uh, on page three, we see, just takes, takes some time. Uh, just waiting for it to load. Uh, here we see the location of the two buildings uh, mid block on 26th Street um, with the key components that we're reviewing today, the fourth floor uh, extension to the existing penthouse at number 23 on the west and the addition of a new elevator and elevator corridor in the combined rear yard, which will serve as the vertical circulation for both buildings. The map also identifies the key viewpoints for the visibility studies and mock-ups we'll be presenting on the following pages. There is no visibility of the proposed work from the vantage points on 26th Street and minor visibility from locations F and G uh, on 25th Street, um, an area about a 12 foot long stretch of sidewalk, which looks over an open parking lot and across the church on the south side of the block on 26th. Uh, as mentioned above, the existing structures at 21 and 23 are just three stories and they are um, surrounded by very large uh, buildings to either side, um, both adjacent on uh, the north side of the block and across the street on the south side of the block. Um, this here presents the elevation with our two buildings encircled in the middle of the larger buildings to both the east and the west. Uh, the historic photos um, show the changes to the facade over time um, and uh, present the reference points for the key details we are uh, trying to restore at staff level. Um, you can see in uh, the lower right hand photo of number 21, the extension which was added uh, in 1991 prior to the designation of the district, which is a, a visible extension and an existing condition. The next page uh, shows the current condition of the, the two buildings, um, 21 on the right, 23 on the left, um, with some of the uh, facade alterations, air conditioners and shutters and, a, and an entryway, which we are um, improving at staff level. Uh, 
and the condition of the existing rear yard um, and uh, where the elevator will be constructed. Uh, on this page, we uh, have the front elevation drawings existing on the left um, and proposed on the right, where you can see in elevation, the fourth floor extension at number 23 and the elevator um, behind the two buildings, um, sort of in the middle there. Um, these elements are visible in pure elevation, but not um, in, uh, in actual massing in real life, which we'll be showing on the subsequent drawings. And in a drawing of the uh, elevator tower in the rear, which is designed in brick with limestone banding to, uh, inspired by the historic facade at number 21. Um, the floor plans existing on the left and proposed on the right, documenting the fourth floor extension and elevator corridor between the two buildings, um, and then uh, mechanical equipment um, on the, the far right side. Uh, this here is a section of number 21, which shows the relationship of the elevator addition in the drawing on the right hand side and a slightly modified bulkhead at number 21 to reduce its visibility, uh, the, the visibility of the existing bulkhead. And a uh, section looking in the opposite direction showing the rooftop extension at number 23 and its relationship to the elevator tower in the rear yard. Then uh, we have um, overall existing section of number 23 and proposed overall section here on the next page um, showing the existing penthouse in the rear and our extension at the front of the building. Uh, photos of the um, rooftop mock-ups, which we completed uh, in coordination with, with Leanne, our staff member. Um, these photos are taken from the roof itself, um, showing that the mock-ups were completed as the subsequent photos on uh, from the street vantage points on 26th Street uh, confirm that uh, with the mock-ups in place, there is no visibility um, from the sight lines uh, A and D on this page, and then sight lines M and N on the next page. Um, the sort of key in question here are, are these uh, sight lines F and G from 25th Street, um, looking across the parking lot where there is minor visibility. You can see um, in the mock-up uh, presented on the left, sight line F, um, the, the small swatch of uh, orange safety netting in the mock-up is presented uh, and um, sight line G, which we've used a red arrow to highlight where there's even a, a smaller sliver of the extension. Um, on the next page um, are uh, additional um, uh, proposed uh, photo montages on the right hand side where the mock-up has been replaced by the proposed materialities uh, uh, for the roof and the windows. Um, and a, a similar uh, uh, photo montage from Sightline G. What you can see in both of these is that the, the tall buildings uh, on the north side of the block mean that even though there is minor visibility here, there is no additional silhouetting created by the rooftop extension or by the elevator tower. And in our final page, um, we're presenting a rendering of the proposed work um, from Sightline F, which shows that the specifications and the materials being selected match the existing materials uh, and aged copper uh, finish for the new roof, which matches the existing standing seam roof on the number 21 extension um, and windows in a um, sort of red burgundy finish to match the windows that are already existing in the number 21 rooftop extension. And then on the right um, are selections for the brick and limestone um, banding that will be used for the elevator tower. Uh, thank you. We look forward to uh, hearing your comments. Thank you very much. Commissioners, do we have any questions? I don't see any questions at this time, so we'll move to public testimony. 
If you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you and I'll turn it over to Sasha Seely to take us through any uh, testimony. Thank you. So I did not receive any signups for this item in advance. So I'm just gonna take a glance over to confirm and I do not see that there's anyone here wishing to speak on this item. So I will just note for the record that we did um, receive a resolution from Manhattan Community Board 5 recommending approval of this application. And I'll turn it back over to you, Chair Carol. Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, not a lot to comment on. I don't, I'd don't. i like to ask the applicants if you'd like to make any final statements before we move to our discussion. Uh, no final statements. I'm okay. happy to answer any questions if, if those occur. All right. And commissioners, are, are there any final questions? Not seeing any, so I'm sending you all requests to unmute. All right, and Commissioner Jefferson, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So motion. And Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion on these uh, buildings, which are um, in a district where there were sort of waves of development that was, have resulted in buildings of various sizes, former residential buildings that were converted for commercial use and taller commercial buildings, and um, even the buildings that were originally built uh, during the residential wave of development were altered over time as were these with other accretions as they converted to other uses. Um, so this is a proposal for additions and there is some partial visibility through the back. So uh, Commissioner Goldblum, would you begin this one? Sure. Um, I really, I think your sum summary of the district is, is really what motivates my thinking on this, that the district is very much a, a um, layered experience uh, where you see these odd juxtapositions of very big buildings and very little ones, very old ones, less old ones, different styles, different uh, heights, different volumes, different ways of treating the city. And especially you know, on this, these two blocks, 26th, 25th, with that church across the street, with, uh, through block, it's, just, I mean, it's a very wonderful little area of the city where you really feel history kind of weaving through as a stratum. Um, and it's for that reason that I think that the, uh, you know, I think that the, the, these two buildings are very, very important because they represent that um, visualization of history very, very strongly on their block. Um, I don't think that the addition is in any way um, uh, inappropriate. I think it, I think the um, addition of the elevator, which is not basically not visible from the front and the, and the rooftop addition is fine. But I, I have to say, even though I know it's something that's well beyond our ability to, to request given you know, the nature of the way these things work, I, I think that the addition over the stent building is a crime. And um, I think that it, it's, a, it's a lost opportunity with the scope of this nature to not modify that, uh, that hurtful addition that disregards the, the charm and quality of the, of the building. Um, but that said, it, it wouldn't prevent me from uh, finding the current application appropriate. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Devonshire? I find this appropriate. Okay, Commissioner Bland? I loved hearing even the brief history of the house. I would love to hear more about the Astors. <clears throat> um, these two buildings that they occupied. Um, I think this is a, a great adaptive reuse of the two buildings um, uh, for, I guess, a corporate use here, headquarters. Uh, so I love the story as it continues. And I completely agree that this is an appropriate um, intervention uh, on the rooftop. Commissioner Lutfi? I agree. I, I think it's appropriate, well done, and very minimally visible in the back. Commissioner Jefferson? I find it very appropriate. Commissioner Gustafson? Nope, appropriate as is, nothing to add. Commissioner Shamir Barron? 
Yes, um, I, uh, I too find it appropriate. I, I, I lived in the 80s and at number 11 and a half West 26th Street. And interestingly, the, your the plan here does not show the 11 and a half. And I'm wondering if, if that has since changed or 11 and a half has just never made it to, to the annotation of the plans of the street plan itself. Anyway, the view, the, the, the rear yard um, on, on this block, it's, it's cut up as, as we see in the plan is such an amazing rear yard because it's like, um, it's like a West Side Story stage set. It's something about it. It's very, um, as, as Commissioner Goldman was saying, you know, and, and others have said, there is such a variety here of periods and uh, accretions and accumulations. And all of those are evidenced on the rear yard, which is, which is just kind of the rears of everything. It doesn't, there is no, obviously no donut. There's no, there's no other kind of charm but it's very raw and spectacular view of the Empire State Building from the rear in this particular block. And I don't know, that may have been, uh, in, 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 there may be buildings now built in front of it on Broadway and beyond that, that obscure that view, but it's a, it's a very powerful um, spot, both on the, on the street and on the, and on the rear. But I, I, I do think that, um, I don't think there's much that could impact that rear, but I don't think this one does. And, um, and as I've said, appropriate. Thank you, Commissioner Chapin. Yeah, I think that the design and materials and the uh, minimal visibility of the rooftop and, and back addition are uh, totally mm -hmm. appropriate. Okay. All right, so I think we um, have a consensus to approve. I know, Michael, you had a concern about the other edition, but um, would you feel comfortable reading this motion? Sure. Okay. Regarding um, 21 to 23 West 26th Street, the Madison Square North Historic District, uh, the application is to construct rooftop and rear yard additions. I note that the building's style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Madison Square North Historic District, and I recommend approval. Finding that the proposed work does not eliminate or damage any significant architectural features of the building. That this pair of buildings has had, have had significant alterations throughout their history, including construction of an addition at number 21 and a reconstruction at facade at number 23. Therefore, the proposed work will be in keeping with the building's history of expansion and alterations. That the rooftop addition and associated mechanical equipment will not be visible from West 26th Street and will only be minimally visible from a limited vantage point on West 25th Street through a parking lot and over a lower building and within the context of larger surrounding buildings and will be visually disconnected from the primary facades of the buildings and therefore will not detract from the buildings or from the adjacent historic buildings. The design and material materials of the proposed rooftop addition featuring a sloped roof with green colored aluminum standing seam metal cladding and an aluminum window assembly with a deep red finish will harmonize with the modern addition at the adjacent building that this building is surrounded by large buildings and other rear yard incursions. And therefore, the presence of the proposed rear yard addition, which is situated in a light court between the two buildings, will not diminish a central green space that the materiality of the rear and elevator addition consisting of brick and stone cladding will harmonize with the buildings and neighboring buildings on the block and that the proposed work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the buildings or the Madison Square North Historic District. Thank you. And Commissioner Devonshire, which was in that motion. Second. All right. And Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. With nine in favor, none opposed, the motion passes. Okay, that's approved. Thank you. And we'll move to the next and final item. Thank you for your consideration. The last uh, item that we'll be looking at today is public hearing item number seven, LPC 21-09081, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1024, lot seven, 243 West 52nd Street. 
the Anta Theater, originally Guild Theater, now Virginia Theater, individual landmark. This is a 15th century Tuscan style theater building designed by Crane and Franzheim and built in 1924 to 25. The application is to establish a master plan governing the future installation of wall signage. Okay, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Uh, Toland, you now have control of the presentation. You just need to perfect click on your screen. Please unmute yourself. You can advance the slides using your arrow keys or your mouse. Please state your name for the record. And you Good afternoon. My name is Toland Grinnell. I'm the VP of Building Operations for Jude Jamson Theater. I'm also joined by Hal Goldberg, who is Jude Jamson's Chief Operating Officer. Uh, we're making a proposal today for the August Wilson Theater. Just a technicality that we conventionally refer to the address of the theater as being 245, but the official address is 243 to 257 West 52nd Street. All right. The August Wilson Theater is located on the northern end of the Broadway Theater District. In this diagram, you can see the theater as a red square on the, the city streets. The theater is directly across the street from the Neil Simon and around the corner from the Broadway Theater. The theater is located on the north side of West 52nd Street between Broadway and 8th Avenue, and it was originally built as the Guild Theater in 1925. In 1985, the theater became a designated landmark. In 2005, it was renamed the August Wilson Theater after the esteemed playwright. And in 2015, the building surrounding the theater on all three sides were demolished and developed into a single mid-rise luxury rental tower with underground parking. In the diagram on the right, you can see the theater surrounded by those three consolidated lots. Here are some alternative views of the theater uh, looking from the west, from the north facing the marquee, and again from the east. The sign that we're proposing uh, would be installed on the west facing wall of the theater. The sign would face 8th Avenue. You can see it as the yellow rectangle in the photo to the left. The sign would display theater related advertisement material only, which would include or could include Broadway shows and other live events, films, TV programs related to Broadway shows or other live events, companies providing products or services to the Broadway or live event industry, or sponsors or vendors of Jude Jamson or a Jude Jamson show. The sign would be changed approximately once a year. The sign would be identical in size to the adjacent blade sign. The sign would be frameless and would be made from printed graphic film designed for textured surfaces. And we would propose that the gray stucco projecting wall would be painted a landmark approved color to help differentiate the historic facade from the demolished structure to the west. We would like to propose to paint the wall a brick color similar in appearance to the tall stage house that you can see looming over the top of the landmark facade. While we were considering the sign, we uncovered this 1940s tax photo. Uh, and you can see clearly that uh, originally this wall did in fact have a sign. And in this photo, you can also see the three story high stone buildings that flank the building to the east and the west. The size of the sign, again, would be the same size as the uh, blade sign that's on the facade. It would be seven foot six wide by 16 foot six tall and would be set back from the corner or edge of the building two feet, which we think will help differentiate the sign from uh, the handsome edge uh, architectural features of the building. The proposed material uh, for this sign would be to use a printed graphic film that's designed for textured surfaces. This is uh, essentially the state of the industry or state of the art right now. 
Uh, this material will be applied directly to the masonry wall surface. The film forms over the contours and textures of the wall, and the material is removable or reversible and wouldn't harm or alter the masonry wall when it's changed. Uh, the material that would be used for this printed sign is 3M Scotch Cow. You can see an image of that product to the left. And here are some examples of lot line signs that are installed in the theater district. And the image to the left is the Gershwin Theater on West 51st Street. This has a similar configuration to what we're proposing at the August Wilson, where there is a blade sign near the corner of the building and then a fixed sign on the lot line wall. In the center is the Imperial Theater. This is a stretched vinyl sign on West 45th. And then further down on West 45th, the Scientology Center has another large stretch vinyl sign on the lot line wall. Here are some examples of signs applied directly to masonry walls in the Midtown area. The image to the left is on the corner of 52nd and 11th Avenue. This is a printed graphic film using mm -hmm. the same kind of material we're proposing for the August Wilson Theater. In the center is the sign that I'm sure everybody is aware of, the large sign that's visible from 34th and 8th Avenue. This is a painted sign. And then to the right is another printed graphic film sign on Park Avenue and 32nd Street. So here are some detailed photos showing the existing conditions of the west wall at the August Wilson. There's some detailed photos of the August Wilson Theater's west wall. The photo on the left has two yellow arrows. Those arrows are pointing towards the subterranean parking or parking ramps. Arrow number one is pointing to the ramp that leads to a parking lot that's below the building that sits across the entire corner of West 52nd and 8th Avenue. And arrow two is pointing towards the ramp that leads to the subterranean parking lot of the large uh, RO building, which is the development that encompassed three lots that around uh, the sides of the August Wilson. The photo on the right shows the walkway that's separated by a parapet wall. This walkway leads to the service entrance of the RO building. Again, the, the mid-rise tower to the north of the theater. You can also see in this photo two other things. One of them is the steel structure that's holding together the lower part of the west wall of the theater. That steel is permanent and was installed in 2015 when the adjacent structures were demolished. And the other thing you can see here is the remnant outline of the original three-story uh, brownstone buildings that were there in the 1920s. We do not believe that these parking lots will be built over, and we do not believe there will be any changes to the appearance of this west wall in the future. So in conclusion, there are existing lot line signs in the theater district and Midtown area that are similar to what we are proposing. The proposed sign would be in keeping with the historic sign located on the same wall from the 1940s. Again, you can see that photo to the right. And the proposed sign would be used for Broadway and live entertainment advertising related content only. And for these reasons, we hope the commission will agree that the sign is appropriate and we're happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. Thank you. All right, we do have some questions. Commissioner Goldblum. Okay, thank you. Um, why did you, were, the, were any of the photographs that you showed um, of signs in the theater district, were those on uh, buildings that were designated landmarks? And were they approved by the commission? I don't know the strict answer to that question. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, and um, the commission has a, a, a pretty long history of approving signs of this nature uh, in other places that are painted on the wall by hand. Why, what, why do you, did you choose to go with a vinyl applique? So I'm gonna back up uh, one 
image here, if I can get it to back up. We had originally had a, a slightly different vision for this sign. Uh, and in the course of our investigation about what might be appropriate or, or, or attractive, uh, we hired a survey company to uh, determine, you know, was the wall actually within our property line? That was an early question we had. And when the survey came back, it was determined that this west wall where we're proposing to put the sign is only one inch within our property line. So there was a moment where we thought the sign might have a frame or might have illumination or other things. And we realized with the very limited space we had, that we were restricted to something that was going to be extremely flat. So then, of course, we explored, well, we should paint the sign. It'll, it'll feel historic. Um, it'll feel more like old Broadway, if you will. Um, and then we started to look carefully at what the logistics of that would be. And the reason why I backed up to this photo is the photo on the right is showing this narrow walkway and parapet wall that separates the parking ramp uh, from the service entrance to the RO building. We, we ran into the reality that trying to work with our neighbor uh, to uh, paint a sign routinely over the top of this narrow service corridor was going to become extremely problematic. And although we might have a good relationship with our neighbor now in, in 2020, 2022, we may not have that kind of easy relationship in the future. And so we started exploring with our sign specialist, you know, what other uh, products or ways could we approach this? And the idea of doing the printed graphic film seemed like the logical conclusion. It would still appear very flat and painted like, if you will. Um, wouldn't have a frame, could be changed uh, in, a, in a single day, and then also wouldn't harm the wall. So this is why it's part of our proposal. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, I think Commissioner Devonshire, did you have a question? No long, was that your question maybe? Michael asked my question. Okay, Commissioner Jefferson. Yes, did I misunderstand you? Um, the, the existing wall now, are you going to paint it with a color? We would propose to paint it uh, a brick color similar to the tall stage house that you can see above the theater. And you, you would paint the whole wall? The, the... We would paint the, um, the projecting wall, that gray stucco wall that um, we would not paint the steel structure or the rest of the brick wall, just the stuccoed wall itself. Just the stucco wall. And, and the example that you showed, uh, we don't have an example of what that would look like. Um, I, don't just, have a, I don't have a mock-up and I would imagine th that we could work with our preservationists to, at a staff level to work on the color. Okay, because it'd be good to see what the holistic, what that face looks like, because that's what you will see from across the street. I mean, you'll be seeing that scar and so, if there was some way that I could be convinced that it would be different, but thank you very much. Um, so I think, you know, the, I think your point is that rather than having to, well, besides the logistics of repainting, every time you want to change the sign, you'd have to paint it and that would be more layers being added to the facade, the side facade, um, that they, this is removable, but in terms of its appearance, you were explaining that it, it reveals the texture of the brick underneath and so it could look like it's painted. Does it have a sheen on it or does it have, you know, what, what's the finish quality and how might that replicate a painted finish? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, so we, uh, the appearance of the product itself is matte. I think when you see the material in daylight, I think probably everyone on, on this Zoom is, a, is familiar with this kind of product. Um, it appears different at different times of day, to be honest. And so if you have raking light and it catches the upper edges of a texture, 
Uh, it may appear glossy, but in fact, the product is matte finished uh, itself. Any other questions? But why don't we move to public testimony and then we'll come back to you. If you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Sasha Seely to take us through the testimony. Thank you. So I did not receive any signups in advance for this item. So I'm just gonna take a glance over, just to double check. And I don't see that there's anyone who wishes to speak on this item. So I'll just note for the record that Manhattan Community Board 5 recommends denial of the application unless the applicant restricts the advertisements which appear on such sign to legitimate theatrical productions produced by the applicant and or its affiliates in the Broadway theaters. And I'll turn it back over to you, Chair Carol. Okay, thank you. So would you like to address the community board concern about the, the content? And you know, commissioners, I'll remind you that we don't necessarily regulate content, but the, we, do, we have looked at um, you know, whether it's text versus imagery. Um, and in, for the painted wall signs that we've approved in some of our industrial dis historic districts, we have um, actually become more flexible about the type of content. But if you can respond directly to the question about the content on your side, that would be helpful. Toland, if I may, I'm Hal Goldberg, I'm Chief Operating Officer. I think, you know, we, we spent a considerable uh, amount of time trying to focus uh, the types of things we would want to advertise on there. We're not asking to be able to advertise anything. We have focused it. Um, you know, when, when, we have thinking about how to expand somewhat the types of things we would want to advertise on there, thinking about our ticketing systems, some of our relationships within the industry, like the Actors Fund. Um, you think about a vendor like Sound Associates who gives out uh, infrared hearing devices and other, uh, other sort of products that for people with disabilities in our theaters. We, we try to expand what we're doing, but also keep it very narrowly focused on Broadway, live events, our theater, the industry at large. We're not looking to sort of throw up a McDonald's ad up there or anything like that. Um, and uh, understanding it's more than just the name of the show or the, 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 the presentation in the theater, but looking for an opportunity to pr present some of these other Broadway, you know, related companies or vendors. And it could be a combination of text and or imagery. Correct. Okay which is sort of what we've historically looked at. All right, Commissioner Chapin and then Commissioner Goldblum again. Uh, yeah, I have a question about the existing sign, which uh, obviously displays uh, uh, the uh, in the mock-up is showing, uh, or the picture rather is showing, uh, you know, the current, uh, let's say, uh, production that's on. It, can that, uh, does that, change and I don't mean can it rotate through things is it is it the kind of uh, display that can rotate through a variety of things it it's not it's uh you have to have a crane come and change the plastic sign faces themselves it's illuminated uh, from within it doesn't have any digital components so it's not a digital or led that's what I was wondering. correct thank you thank you very much Okay, Commissioner Goldblum. Just a question for staff, or maybe Corey or you. Um, I would imagine that every painted wall sign that, that the commission approves is uh, by its nature on, on a lot line. and Therefore the access to that wall must be obtained with the cooperation of the neighbor. How do they, how do they negotiate this? I mean, is it, you know, are, are the painters who, whom we approve on a regular basis for, you know, do they run into trouble with access? Well, I'll let Corey go, but I think in the, I, I think we'd have to say we probably don't know and we'd assume that they've worked out some arrangement with neighbors. Um, and I think many times on a, you know, sort of a typical five-story building in Soho, they can hang a swing scaffold from, down from the top without having to actually go onto the uh, neighbor's property, even though they'd be overhanging. 
Corey, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that or know from your experience, the kinds of arrangements that are made. Yeah, I, I think what you said last is right, that it's most often done with a swing stage that's rigged and dropped from their own roof and overhangs it for a short period of time. And because this roof is a terracotta roof, you couldn't do that. I, that's probably an applicant a uh, question for the applicant, but I do think that's what they expressed earlier. May, may I yes, please add go ahead. some color to this? So two two things. One, yes, we don't have a, a convenient, easy way to rig this building with a suspended scaffold because of the land historic type clay tile roof. The second thing, uh, anecdotally, I've spent most of my career in, in large scale construction and restoration business and have worked on and adjacent to many properties in the downtown area that have painted signs. And in all of those different instances, the sign was uh, over the top of an adjacent building's roof so that when we would suspend a scaffold or when a vendor would suspend a scaffold to paint a sign, a sidewalk bridge wasn't required. And so you could have an access agreement with your neighbor that was really more about protection, but not necessarily pedestrian protection, which is the second layer of problem that we have here is that we are right over the top of this uh, service entrance corridor to this other very large building. So those two things combined are really what started to drive us uh, in, in the direction of using the, the printed vinyl. Thank you. Okay, other questions? All right, I think we can move to close the hearing and begin our discussion then. So Commissioner Bland, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you, and Commissioner Gustafson, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed. So I think this is kind of an interesting application on a, a few different levels. We certainly have had experience with painted uh, wall sign, advertising signs on lot lines in some of our historic districts, particularly the industrial or traditionally industrial or commercial historic districts. Um, and we have, you know, sort of evolved to a policy where if they are small, uh, uh, relative to the entire side wall that uh, we are pretty flexible on content and allow any um, any combination of text or imagery as long as it's painted. Um, we have not yet um, seen this material. I think the staff has started to see it from applicants, um, other applicants, but we, I don't think we as the commission has re have reviewed it yet. Um, but one of the benefits that has been presented to us in those cases is that it um, allows for fewer layers of paint on the side brick facades, which may be better for the facades and that it's easily reversible without having to do heavy stripping. Um, and that it does have a sort of painterly finish because you can read the texture through it. Um, and then the other thing to think about in, in, that, in those cases, we really are looking at a historic district and the impact on the historic district as a whole. In this case, we are looking at an individual landmark and this sort of utilitarian side facade. So it's a slightly different analysis. Um, but it, when we have looked at signage on facades, as well as primary facades and side facades and roofs of in other individual landmarks in Times Square, we have noted, while not a historic district, we have noted that these buildings have always been in a district or an area that historically had a vibrant history of signage and, uh, and that with evolving technology, those signs have evolved and we've allowed a number of illuminated signs on various individual landmarks in, in the Times Square area because of that history. Um, and in this case, we can see that this building did have a sign um, actually on this side wall historically. So there is some precedent for the commission looking at signs on buildings and uh, non-traditional locations on buildings. And, um, and even at this building, there is a precedent for the sign on the side. Um, 
So then the question is again about what material and that it should be. And I think, you know, it's uh, this material intrigues me because I do think there's some unique challenges at this particular site, but I also do wonder about the, you know, the effect that repeated painted applications have on our historic buildings and do wonder whether this material might alleviate some of that and still have a painterly appearance. Um, so we, you know, we don't have a, a mock-up of it, but I think um, if there's any place that one could test a different material, you know, perhaps the Times Square area would be one of those places on this very utilitarian side of the building. Um, and that way we may be able to think about it differently in other historic districts as well. So I think it's just, this is, there's a lot of, a lot to think about here. Um, so we'll begin our discussion. And I think Commissioner Devonshire, would you like to start on this one? I, I guess, um, <laughs> well, to begin with it's, it's, very likely that it's Portland cement based stucco on this wall. And so um, if the wall is painted and an adhesive, somewhat adhesive sign is applied to it, the worst that's going to happen is it's gonna pull the paint off of the stucco when it goes. So that's a maintenance issue that, that we don't necessarily have to worry about. I, I, the first thing that strikes me is how on earth was this facade allowed to have that blade sign that's sticking out of it? Um, you know, to, to me, that that's the real, the villain here. Um, on the other hand, I, I, um, I'm, I'm at a loss to think of why someone would wanna put one sign within what looks like about 10 feet of another sign. But, you know, that's not my purview either. What, I, what my purview is, is the, uh, the individual landmark. And I have to say that to me, the most important thing going on with this building is that front principal facade. And this sign does nothing to obscure it, to take attention away from it. And so I'm actually okay with this. Um, so there. Okay, thank you. Commissioner yeah. Bland. Um, yeah, I, I was a little confused about what all the hullabaloo was about. <laughs> There's a picture on the right showing a sign, a picture on the <coughs> left showing a proposed sign in almost the exact position. Uh, there is a blade sign, which I presume we approved or at least it predates us. Uh, so the relationship of the two could be questioned, but I don't think we have a right to necessarily deny it because of that. Uh, so, and, and to the degree this is a new um, material, um, um, I think it's, it's appropriate to try it out. And this is a good place to do it. And I'm all in favor of this. Great. Commissioner Lutfi? She, I don't, she had to leave. Commissioner Jefferson? Um, I can approve this. I, I just worry about the, the stucco um, and if they're going to paint it, I would like to see it painted and in relationship to the unpainted part. But if that's not going to happen, I can do this on. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Gustafson? Well, I, I'm, I, I'm inclined to approve it, but I do have a couple of comments on it. Um, you know, this is an individual landmark, and that, and that you know, ra always raises the standard. Um, and uh, um, and this, although there seems to be a relatively high volume of signage on this building relative to the uh, size of the building, it, um, uh, you know, it, it, I do agree with Commissioner Devonshire that it's the front of the building that really matters here. Um, um, however. Um, with regard to the, the material being used for it, but might I suggest that we, since this is supposed to be a master plan, that we approve this with a shorter term than we might otherwise approve a master plan, um, just so that we can see how this material, um, uh, how it looks, 
um, how it with, withstands the weather, et cetera, et cetera. So rather than, uh, I don't know what we typically would do, whether it would be a five-year period or whatever, maybe we should do it for a, for a three and just see how it goes and, um, and make a determination in the future. Right, we, I think we typically do 10 years for those other master plans. So, so maybe, so maybe, maybe something it's... significantly shorter than that because right. uh, um, you know, if this turns out to be a disaster, we don't really wanna be locked in for 10 years. Okay, so maybe a, a five-year term to do it for a five-year term. Are you, are you nego yeah, yeah, Chair Carol, are you negotiating with me? Is that what you're doing? <laughs> but I do, because I do think that we really have treated signage very differently on individual landmarks in this particular neighborhood. And I think I, I want to also sort of respect those, that past regulatory history as well. But um, yes, so I would negotiate up to five. <laughs> I, I'm sticking with three. So. Okay, Commissioner Shamir Barron. Hi, uh, yes. So I, like um, Commissioner Drepinshire, I'm really surprised about the blade sign, but it's, um, it, but the, and, and the fact is that the 1940s photograph, yes, it does show a sign on the sidewall. Um, but there was no blade sign. So uh, that m maybe that made sense for that, for that period or something there. Um, I also think that this particular return um, is actually very kind of important to our understanding of the building. I don't necessarily agree with that, that the, that the, kind of the, the value or the special quality of this historic building is only the kind of the front facade because understanding that kind of shed roof, even at, at the way that it existed, um, it's in other words, it's not kind of a leftover that happens once a demolition occurs. It existed in the 1940s condition too with the setback of the, of the shorter building adjacent to it. So I think it's a very important part of the, of the read of the building on the street and it's unusual. Um, the way that we under that we see that kind of you know we understand that there might be a some kind of a special roofing material there or historic roofing material because of that particular angle that we would that we see from the street face. So I don't think it's secondary. I think it belongs to the primary. Um, so when I was looking at this and and I want to I'm trying to remember that I was very much opposed to um, to painted even painted sign on the other individual landmark, the Baird Condit building, the, um, the Sullivan building. Um, uh, and I oppose that. So I'm, I'm trying to remember what my thinking was there. And I just felt that it really took away from the, in qu the quality, the, the, the kind of the stature of the individual landmark. And, I, and it is a little, you are right, it's a little bit different in this particular district and the edge of this district where there is a lot of signage. So I'm, I'm conflicted on that. I think that the sign as they've proposed it is actually strange size in, in the way that it kind of is, is like the blade sign, but not like the blade sign. So my first instinct was it shouldn't be here at all, this what's being proposed. And then I was, and when they showed us the, the other precedent, the other conditions in other theaters, I where there are much larger painted signs, I thought, well, wait a second, maybe this should be a much larger sign so that it really kind of calls attention to that ex to that return and says, we're, this belongs to, this is the theater. This is the theater's edge. And this is the way we advertise the stuff that's going on in the theater, it belongs to the building. I, I don't like what's being, what's proposed here now. I don't think that the size is right. I'm less concerned about the material um, but, uh, you know, the, the, the application of this um, adhesive material that bothers me a little bit less, but I don't think it's quite right either. Uh, and I do think that this is, a, is an individual landmark and that this side edge is an important part of its individual stature. So I think I'm against it. Okay. Okay. I do, you know, I, I, I think I do want to, though, remind everybody that we have on individual landmarks throughout this neighborhood, 
approved illuminated signs on side and on primary facades over windows and decorative features so and on roofs and okay. so you know we have sort of looked at the tradition of signage in in this area so i think you know given the precedent of a historic sign on this particular building in this location um i, I think it for me it, knowing that we've approved so much more on other individual landmarks it's hard to say that something that's comparable to what they had historically is not appropriate. But I think the size does look odd in that the montage, and I don't know if it's the rendering because I think it's supposed to actually match the size of the blade sign and it doesn't look like, it looks taller and skinnier in, the, in this yellow rendered box. So that may be a rendering error. Okay, Commissioner Chapin. Okay, so, uh... Yes, they may not have done themselves a favor by using uh, just a, a patch of yellow rather than uh, some representation of a painted sign, uh, which is not going to be but a vinyl sign. So first of all, you know, I, I like painted wall signs a lot, and I'm very not so uh, comfortable with the vinyl sign. And the particular problem I have here, though, is that this sign right up against, uh, you know, near the uh, blade sign, to me, just I, I, I find it very distracting, and I don't think it's appropriate uh, in that location. Um, it, if they want to have something that's very changeable, uh, having one of their signs somewhere be a digital sign, either the blade sign or something else where they could have new messages on a regular basis without, you know, hopefully having to have a crane, uh, you know, uh, go up every time to change. Things would seem more sensible to me. And when, I don't know if it would really be less costly for them. I mean, we'd have to approve it, obviously, if it was an LED or digital sign, one of their signs, I assume. Yeah. But I feel like there's enough signage on this building already, and I don't like the idea of a sign right next to uh, that blade sign, because I think if you're looking at uh, view six, it's very distracting. And um, maybe if it had been, you know, had, had been shown in a different way, it would look less distracting, but I just feel like I, I wouldn't normally approve another sign right next to another a sign in this position. So I'm, I'm not comfortable with it, I'm afraid, in this particular case. Right. right. I mean, I, I guess I feel because, you know, when you are going to the theater and you look down the long side streets, there is a lot of signage to show you the theater that you're trying to approach. And I think because of this unfortunate situation next door with the parking ramps, there's a void there that um, you know, perhaps makes it less, uh, you know, noticeable as a, as a destination. Yeah. All right. Commissioner Goldblum. Wow. Interesting conversation. Um, uh, I, I, um, I agree with a lot of what Adi said about the importance of the sidewall especially given the fact that these ramps are not gonna go away anytime soon. Uh, so the reading of the building as a three-dimensional object, uh, even if that was not contemplated by the original architect and was not a consideration when the building was designed, I think is an important aspect of how it is perceived now in the district or in the, in the area um, as, a, as an individual structure. And so I think that the applicant's choice to paint the side wall to match the brick is a good one. Um, I think that what I would suggest is that that paint not extend over the shadow of the former townhouse so that the reading of the, of the layers of the history of the site can be more uh, evident to a layperson walking down the street. Uh, and so that the paint should extend to that scar, uh, both on the top and on the side, uh, to kind of define it with, with the brick color. I think that's an appropriate way to go. And it improves, I think, the three-dimensional reading of the building 
uh, as one sees it on the street. In terms of the quantity of signage, I, I agree with you, Chair Carroll, that this district is about its signage and its theater signage in specific. So I really don't have any concern about the notion of another sign here, even though it is next to an unpleasant and probably pre-date, you know, pre-existing blade sign. Uh, I don't think that that in and of itself disqualifies it for me as an appropriate sign. I do think, however, that the sign regulations that we impose on other folks in terms of border and content and you know, the, uh, the, the rather rather modest limitations that we impose on those other signs be imposed here as well, with the exception of the paint. Now, for me, the, the, the use of a painted, or the, the painted sign is important, not only because that's how it was done in the past, but because it preserves an industry in our city um, that I think is as valuable as as preserving buildings, you know, we preserve the cast iron industry, the wrought iron industry, the terracotta industry, all of these, these industries, you know, leaded glass have, have, have done well because of the um, uh, popularity of, of, of historic preservation. And so I think the perpetuation of painted signage is, is in that category for me. But the applicant, I think, has convinced me that this is an a, this is a, a, an application of that technology that would not be um, successful. Um, so I'm willing to go with the uh, the application of the vinyl sign as long as it's made clear that number one, it does adhere tightly to the um, substrate and shows telegraphs the content of the substrate, you know, the, the texture of the substrate as the applicant demonstrated, and that it's uh, of a finish that would be similar to what we would see in the case of, of paint. Um, and I, I, I don't know whether I, 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 think, I think John's idea about limiting the duration is probably a good one. I'm not too afraid that it would be un, uh, unsuccessful. I think it would be, I think as long as it, it looks like the ones that he showed us, I think it would be hard for most folks to see it um, but I, I, I think that it, it is not a bad idea in case I'm totally wrong. Okay. All right. So thank, I want to thank everybody for your thoughts and comments on it. I do think it was an interesting discussion and interesting to think about. I do think we have, um, six of us to approve it with some modifications. One being that it be, um, have the same restrictions that we applied for other painted wall signs, such as the border, and that it be as tightly adhered to the substrate as possible, and that we limit it for a three-year term to be reevaluated after that time. So why don't I go ahead and make that motion, and then we'll do the vote and see where we end up. Okay, in the matter of docket number 21-09081-243 West 52nd Street, uh, it's actually August Wilson Theater, originally Guild Theater, then Virginia Theater, and, and then Anta Theater, individual landmark, a 15th century Tuscan style theater building designed by Crane and Franzheim and built in 1924 to 25. This is an application to establish a master plan governing the future installation of wall signage. And I recommend approval with modifications, finding that the wall signs are traditional, Wall signs are a traditional method of advertising to typically on plain secondary facades and that Broadway theaters have historically featured a large quantity and variety of signage. That the proposed sign will be installed at an undeveloped secondary elevation consisting of plain painted uh, and stucco coated masonry and will not conceal any significant architectural features. That the sign will be reminiscent of and placed in a similar location to the historic lot line wall sign that was present historically at the building. That the installation will be easily reversible and will not damage any historic fabric. And that the use of vinyl instead of paint will allow the sign, which is over a walkway to a service entrance at a separately owned building to be quickly changed without disrupting access to the service entrance, that the printed graphic film will reveal the contours and texture of the wall surface so the final appearance will be in keeping with the traditional painted application methods and historic commercial character of painted wall signs, 
that the sign and that the sign content will be changed approximately once per year and that the proposed master plan will be valid for a period of three years and that the applicant will document every sign approved under the master plan. So there will be a record the commission can consider when reviewing the effectiveness of the master plan criteria. And I also recommend that the um, uh, some of the other uh, uh, restrictions that we apply to the painted wall signs in other districts, including a border and setback be applied to this master plan and that the, um, that the paint not extend beyond the line of the where the, of where the former row house met the theater and that the uh, material be as adhered as tight adhered as tightly as possible to the brick working in consultation with the staff All right and would uh, commissioner devonshire would you second that motion second all right thank you mark will you call the vote chair carroll aye commissioner bland aye Commissioner Shamir Barron? No. Commissioner Chapin? Uh, nay. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. And that's it. That's uh, six in favor and two opposed. The motion passes. Okay. All right. So that's approved um, with those conditions and uh, please continue to work with the staff and we look forward to seeing the examples of each of the signs and looking and to see how effective this material and this master plan criteria are thank you and that thank concludes you thank you that concludes our hearing today i want to thank everybody for participating and as always thank you commissioners for your time and dedication and, and thought thank Take you care we'll see you next week yeah. And we'll also ask every member of the public to exit the meeting so that we can close our webinar. <laughs>